Welcome on in everybody. We are going to get started in about three minutes. Good to see so many people here. You can go ahead and open up the Zoom chat. Um, some people are introducing themselves and we also have links to the things that are mentioned on the slide. Just smiling at all these responses from out of state. This is kind of the first time we've gotten to do this with our Lilly conference. Very cool. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Claire Lapolt. I'm this year's Lilly Chair, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh annual and first virtual conference of lifelong information literacy. Um, Lilly started as a group of California library workers from all different types of libraries. Um, and our mission is to investigate models and standards of information literacy and to craft and share um, excellent models of information literacy and lifelong sequential learning. Um, and we're very excited that this is kind of our first opportunity to have people from out of state, people from out of the country presenting and attending this conference. Um, so look out for our conference evaluation survey later. You'll have a chance to let us know a little bit about what you're looking for in the Lilly Listserv and um, help us shape this group as it, as it grows and expands. Hmm. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that um, we and our communities are going through a really difficult time this year. Um, on the lighter side, my students had canceled graduations, BTS concerts, pride parades, anime expos, all canceled. And students and instructors have been struggling to find motivation and healthy balance in isolation. Further, there's a good chance that our communities are dealing with serious challenges like the loss of a loved one, uncertainty about employment, housing, childcare, immigration status, and all of these things make it very hard to learn. Um, library workers have been grappling with big questions about the future of many aspects of this field and 
for many of us, we've been becoming remote instructors at a moment's notice in the middle of a pandemic. So we're not gonna solve all of these problems today, but I wanted to make them all mentionable because this is what our communities are dealing with. And um, I'm especially grateful that we can meet because everything you can share from fun little tips to big ideas, those are going to help us as library workers and as instructors to mitigate these situations for our communities going forward. And um, difficult times make me especially grateful for what I've always found to be the spirit of Lily, and that is collegiality and volunteerism and thoughtful patient committee work. So I'm just very grateful that we can get together today in that spirit. Um, I'd like to go over a couple logistics for our Zoom meeting today. The chat is, uh, so there's a Zoom panel down at the bottom. You can access the chat through that panel. Those of us with FAC in our names and Lily backgrounds, we are here as facilitators for the day. Um, so you can feel free to reach out to any of us if you need help. There is also a virtual um, help desk document and um, our moderators can share that in the chat as well. That is a place you can go to get um, your questions answered in real time if any issues appear. Um, I'd also ask that we all keep our volumes muted while we're in the main Zoom room if you're not presenting. You are in control over whether your Zoom video is on or off and please feel free, be comfortable, um, tune in and out as you need to throughout the day and eat when you need to, that kind of thing. Uh, we all know Zoom meetings can be kind of fatiguing. I'd like to give a reminder of our Lily Code of Conduct. We strive to support um, an atmosphere that is conducive to respectful exchange of ideas. Um, so please be respectful. Also know that if you're having any issues with this, you can reach out to one of the moderators or go to our help desk document. Um, another detail with Zoom logistics. You, uh, one second. Okay, yes. So that document is there. Um, also, this session is being recorded. The, that includes the chat. And so you are able to send private chats to participants. Just know that that does get included in the final transcript. So they're not actually private. Good detail to be aware of also in Zoom classes. <laughs> um, I would like to introduce uh, my vice chair and our incoming chair, Eva Rios Alvarado. And um, please welcome Eva. Oh, I Thanks. forgot to say there are uh, reactions you can do as well. Let's practice doing the clapping reaction on that Zoom panel. Thank you, welcome. Thanks, Claire. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, my name is Eva Rios Alvarado. I'd like to welcome you, um, so bienvenida ex Biali, to um, LilyCon 2020. Uh, my pronouns are she and hers. Um, and so I'm so excited to be here with everybody um, from folks who are here um, locally. I saw somebody, there was an L MLIS student here in Los, from Los Angeles, to folks who are in different countries and around the country. Um, this year's LilyCon was supposed to take place on my, my campus, Mount San Antonio College, here in the greater Los Angeles area, um, but of course we have transitioned to this venue here to be with you. Um, with that, uh, we would like to do our land acknowledgement, territory acknowledgement, to, um, to, to acknowledge the lands um, of where Mount San Antonio College is, but we also would like to ask you to acknowledge um, the indigenous lands um, that where you reside. So a little bit about um, land territory acknowledgements. There are formal statements that recognize and respect the indigenous peoples and caretakers, stewards um, of a given geographic area um, and the relationship that exists between the indigenous peoples um, wherever you are located um, and I am located and their ancestral territories. Um, at, for Mount San Antonio College, which is where my um, campus is, 
we would like to recognize that the land of that campus is situated um, on land that is Gabrielino Tongva. Um, and according to the, the Gabrielino Tongva website, um, that Tong the Gabrielino Tongva lands extend from the areas of Malibu to Laguna Beach and all the way to the San Bernardino Mountains. Um, we would also like to acknowledge that um, the Gabrielina Tongva have been indigenous to the LA Basin and the South Channel Islands for over 7,000 years. Thank you, Claire. I'm just gonna go to the next slide. We would also like to take a moment um, to acknowledge the work of, of our, our Black um, librarians and archivists who have made it possible even for BIPOC to participate in MLIS LIS spaces. And so with that, we want to amplify a message by um, our comrade and um, somebody that I dearly respect, who's a community college librarian in Pennsylvania, Amanda M. Leftwich. She is the founder of Mindful and MLIS. And I would like to just take a moment um, and ask you to take a moment that we honor these words that she has shared on her Twitter, excuse me, Twitter and Instagram. Amanda states this, Black archivists matter. Black healers matter. Black librarians matter. Black library workers matter. Black minds matter. Black queer lives matter. Black lives matter. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. All right, I'm going to end screen share here. And all right, now let me get those reactions out. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Ray Andrade. Um, I'm trying to share my screen but it's telling me host disabled attendee screen share. Oh, let's fix that really quick. Sorry okay. about that. It's okay. But in the meantime, while Claire works on that, like I really wanted to say a big thank you to Eba, to Claire, to the entire Lily team for pivoting the Lily conference to an online experience. Like look at what, you're, what you've all done. There's 150 people present right now. So again, hats off to you, kudos to you for doing this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Ray, we just turned you into a co-host. Are you able to share? Yes, I should be able to now. Looks like it. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Does everybody see that okay? Can I get a thumbs up from someone? Thank you. Thank you, Claire. All right. So good morning, everybody. So again, my name is Ray Andrade. My pronouns are he and him. I'm a librarian for student engagement at Loyola Marymount University, which is, which is in Los Angeles. Um, so for today, it's kind of funny that my presentation is about a presentation. So I'll explain that in, in the second slide. Um, but for today, this presentation is called LMU Sue, Ditch the Bullet Points and Develop a Library Orientation Story. So to give you some background about this, um, LMU is a private university in LA. It has a, almost 10,000 students total between undergraduates and graduate students. Every year, the university welcomes approximately 1,500 students to campus. And at the beginning of every academic year, there's this colossal mess of an event called Welcome Weekend. So during Welcome Weekend, all of the brand new students, they're divided into different groups according to college, whether it's the College of Business, College of Science, Etc., and everybody is taken to a different auditorium where they get to listen to different departments talk about those departments' services and resources. So, the library is one of those departments that's invited to the party. So, a couple of years back in 2018, um, the people who coordinate Welcome Weekend, the Division of Student Affairs, they really encouraged everybody to really shake things up, to make it interesting, make things engaging. So, the library's response was to develop a story. And every story has to have its characters. So we developed a central character named LMU Sue. So we developed this character with one goal in mind, which was to reduce library anxiety. So 
this is the last ugly slide, I promise. So as far as the planning phase goes, um, the library was invited to present, but right off the bat, um, I insisted that we share the stage with the university's academic resource center, because my, my belief on this is that if the library is gonna be serious about academic success for students, then it has to partner with the academic resource center, um, which is not inside the library. The academic resource center is far away, like on the opposite end of campus. And the academic resource center, it features, for example, the writing, the writing center, writing tutors, um, academic subject tutors, et cetera. So our services are very complimentary. So we invited the Academic Resource Center to co-present with us. So the presentation that, you, that you're gonna see in, this, in a moment, um, I'm gonna be showing excerpts in a second, but just imagine if you will, you're a first year student, you're in the audience amongst like 300 other students from your college, and you have two presenters on stage, one from the library and one from the Academic Resource Center. So before, before Welcome Weekend, the staff from the Academic Resource Center and the two librarians from the library outreach department, myself and a gentleman named John Jackson, we met about three or four times over the summer to develop the character. Like we, we worked on character, character development. We did a lot of, a lot of storyboarding. Um, and in the end, we developed a specific script, like a, a script that we were actually able to print out so that not only, not only can John and I read off the script, but that also some of our students who supervise could jump in as co-presenters and read from the script as well. Because trust me, even though staff were on stage reading off of a script, given the nature of the presentation, all eyes were on the screen, all eyes were on LMUSU. You'll see that in a second. Um, so after we had a script ready, we were able to schedule a professional photographer to come to campus and it definitely paid off. So there's Hopefully you'll think that the pictures are cute and adorable and funny. Um, so we had to plan the, the shots that we wanted to stage anywhere from inside the library all the way to inside LMUSU's dorm. Um, so I already mentioned that we also incorporated students into the planning process. So I supervise approximately 10 library ambassadors and I use them as, as consultants to make sure that this that the, that, the, that the story basically does speak to an 18 year old, somebody who's fresh out of high school. Um, so we, I use them as consultants. And again, I use them as co-presenters. And the last missing piece that was really, really instrumental to the success of this presentation was the orientation leaders. So these orientation leaders, they don't work for the library. They work for the, for the Division of Student Affairs. This is a team of about 40 to 50 students who are either sophomores or juniors or seniors um, who are basically cheerleaders. They give, they give campus tours to the new students and they offer advice. And they were really instrumental because before Welcome Weekend happened, before Showtime took place, we were able to do a, like a preview presentation, kind of like an advanced screening with the orientation leaders. And I, it kind of feels like, like a film director observing an audience reacting to their film. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like that. So we were able to see like what kind of reactions we solicited from the orientation leaders. And at the end, we were able to collect feedback. And sure enough, we did incorporate a lot of recommendations to the LMUSU storyline, as you're gonna see in a moment. In fact, there's a moment when the story makes a reference to Bachelor in Paradise. I'm not savvy, but apparently back in 2018, this was a reality TV show that was popular with a lot of folks. Um, so anyway, um, again, the orientation leaders were instrumental in that regard. And they were also instrumental um, as far as preparing them for roles. So we gave, we gave them a, a role to play, basically to plant themselves in the audience and to really help with the emotional reactions that we wanted to elicit from, from the audience. So there's gonna be parts of the story where LMUSU is sad. Aww. There's parts of the story where LMUSU is triumphant and happy and there's yay and there's clapping and all of that. So the orientation leaders, being the cheerleaders that they are, they were very instrumental for doing that. So, second here. So obviously I'm not gonna read, I'm not gonna read it directly from the script. Um, so in the next, I don't know, 10 slides or so, I'm going to, there's going to be some sections where I am going to read directly from the script and I'll, I'll try to make that as obvious as possible. And in the interest of time, there's going to be some slides where I'm just going to describe what's happening. Okay. So 
this is the very first slide that people see. So after we're introduced by the Department of Student Affairs, you know, we say something like, hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Ray Andrade. I'm one of LMU's friendly and helpful librarians. And then the ARC staff member will say, hi, my name is Dr. Morgan Gross. I'm the Writing Center Director. And we're here to, we're here to welcome everybody to, to LMU. And this is LMU Sioux. So we take a moment to talk about who LMU Sioux is. We say LMU Sioux is a first generation college student. She's from Colorado, so she's an out of state student. She's kind of shy, kind of introverted. She loves to FaceTime with her family and she loves to hang out with her best friend and roommate, Lisa. And Lisa, Lisa and Sue both learn about how helpful and friendly the librarians are during orientations. So side note, the phrase friendly and helpful librarian, I lost count of how many times this is, this is said because we really wanted to drill this during the presentation because again, we want to reduce library anxiety. So after that, the script kind of gets into how it's week number one. It's week number one and LMU Sue has her syllabus. And according to her syllabus, she's supposed to find some books at the library that are on reserves. So she finds one of her books and while she's at the library, she's also wondering if the library has any of the other books that her professor is requiring her to purchase. Some of these books are also expensive. So hopefully she's able to locate the books in the library. So the student at the circulation desk recommends that she talk to a librarian at the reference desk to see if the library could help her locate the, the rest of her books. So then Ellen Yusu discovers the reference desk. And I'm not going to go verbatim, but this is where she, she engages with the librarian at the information desk. And the librarian helps her locate one of her books as, an, as, a, as a free ebook at the library. And she's also able to locate a physical copy of one of her other books from a nearby library. So she learns what interlibrary loan is and how this is a free service. So thanks to that, Ellen Yusu was able to save a lot of money. And Ellen Yusu is happy and there's clapping. Again, the old leaders are planted in the audience. They're very, they're very happy for Ellen Yusu. And then it's week number two. Ellen Yusu has all of her, finally has all of her books. And now she's getting, she's gonna get ready to study. On one evening, she goes back to her dorm, but she finds out that her roommate Lisa suddenly planned a watch party to watch Bachelor in Paradise. So now suddenly she has no place to study. But she remembers that the friendly helpful librarian at orientation said that the library has plenty of study spaces at the library. But wait a minute, it's almost 10 p.m. Is the library open late? It turns out that yes, it is. In fact, she remembers that the friendly helpful librarian said that the library is actually open 24 hours a day, five days a week between Monday and Friday. So once again, LMU Sue is happy. And there's a lot of cheering. So you kind of get the idea for what, what, the, what the tone of the presentation is. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep this moving along. Um, so during this presentation, there's also a moment when to shake things up once again, there's, there's a break, there's a, there's a one minute break when the library presents a one minute video. Um, it's basically a welcome video that features library staff saying, hel saying welcome. So if it's okay, um, I know that Ding, one of the Lily facilitators is gonna help me with this. So I would love it if everybody who's present could also take a look at this video as well. The video is, is one minute long, but we'll give everybody approximately two minutes to watch it on a separate browser. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hit play. So Ding, do you wanna facilitate that? Yes, it's now on the links now. Thank you. I think we're going to put the link in the chat for everybody to go ahead. Apologies, I'm still finding the links. Um, it's coming up soon.
I see that Aisha added a link to the chat as well. Thank you. Good looking out, Aisha. Thank you. Yes. Great. So Ray, we're watching the video now. Yeah. Some people did already. Okay. Do you think that was that was enough time for people to watch it? Okay, I know that Claire has her mic muted, but I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that that was enough time for folks to watch that minute video. You think? I yeah, I think so. I, okay, Thank you. Cool. All right. So I hope you all enjoyed that. So again, that's in the interest of of alleviating library anxiety. So I'm gonna move a little bit faster. So now the story comes back to, and I'm gonna paraphrase, I'm not gonna read any more of the script, um, but here at this point of the story, um, Claire is back in her dorm, she's working on a research paper. Suddenly she, re she realizes she needs a librarian. She remembers that the librarian at orientation mentioned that the library has live chat available 24 seven. So she pops open her, she fires up her laptop, goes to the library homepage, uses live chat. The librarian on live chat helps her locate a scholarly article, no problem. So she's happy once again. So then comes the part for the ARC. So she's having writing struggles. She's having trouble focusing. So in this part of the story, we, the, the presenters say like, oh yeah, we forgot to mention something about Sue. She's in a long-term relationship. She's struggling because she misses her partner back in Colorado. Um, so Lisa, her roommate notices that Sue is sad. So Lisa declares, okay, forget this. We're gonna have a watch party. So, but then they realize like, uh-oh, we don't have Netflix accounts. So library to the rescue, no Netflix, no problem. The library has thousands. Of, thank you. The library has, the library has um, lots of streaming videos. So again, um, they're both happy at that point. And she's working on a history project. She discovers special collections. She discovers that the special collections department actually has actual civil war items to help her with her research. So there's an intermission. And this is a moment when we tell people about our upcoming events. We ask the freshman students to follow us on social media. She discovers consultations with the librarian meeting one on one um, for further research assistance. Midterm shock, she finds out that she gets a midterm deficiency in one of her philosophy classes. So again, um, at this point, she could she got a bad grade because she couldn't focus because of, she actually she ends up breaking up. She ends up breaking up with her partner. So yes, this elicits a very sad response from the audience. Um, but she promises to, she vows to redeem herself. So she begins to use the Academic Resource Center like there's no tomorrow. So she discovers that the Academic Resource Center has advising. So here she is meeting with an advisor. And I'm about to wrap up now. So it's finally the end of finals week. And thanks to using the Academic Resource Center and the library, um, she discovers that she actually did a lot better than she expected during finals exams. Um, so there was a lot of stress that was relieved at that point. But even on top of that, she discovered that during finals week, the library actually has therapy animals. So here's a yoga goat in case anybody has never heard of yoga goats before. That thing was heavy. It was about 40 pounds. Thank you very much. Um, so this is where we wrap up the presentation with the students. So here was, so here we say something like, so, Given all of the support that LMU Sue discovered at the Academic Resource Center and with the helpful and friendly librarians, LM, LMU Sue is confident that the next four years at LMU are going are gonna to be easy thanks to the library and thanks to the ARC. So in the end, Sue is happy and successful. And that, my friends, 
is the end of our story. So that's the end of the story for the students. And I don't know if there's enough time. Thank you. I don't know if there's enough time. There's a 12 second video. There's a 12 second video that's posted on Instagram. This video was not at all. I did not plan on recording this video. That's why it's, it's only 12 seconds. But this video is, a, is, a, is footage of the reaction from students in the audience. So I'm never gonna forget this particular audience. These were the students from the School of Film, the College of Film and Television. So if folks could take, could take 30 seconds to look at that video and then I'll leave it to questions. Wow, look at the hype in that video. That's some great reactions, Ray. Um, we do have a couple minutes if you would like to take, if, if the moderators would like to give you any questions from the audience. Sure. Just to, maybe one or two. Um, the first question we got is from Megan Bell. Um, she's asking how much time did you have to present this information to students? Thank you for bringing that up, 20 minutes. So in total, we had up to 20 minutes, but in reality, this presentation only took about 12 minutes. And thankfully so, because that allowed us a lot of time for a Q&A at the end of those sessions. So just in, I mean, the presentation would, would generate some questions from the freshmen, but just in, case, just in case there were ever any crickets, like if there was like dead silence, the orientation leaders, again, they were very instrumental because they were planted in the audience. Like they would be like, hey, can you clarify again? How did LMUSU use interlibrary loan? Is that, is that a free service or not? So the orientation leaders helped us with that. But yeah, in total, we had up to 20 minutes to present this. Thank you, Ray. Our next question is from Kirsten Hansen. How did you recruit your model? So she works for the Academic Resource Center. And we, the staff at the Academic Resource Center, like right away, they identified her. They were, they were like, we know exactly who would be perfect. This student is, is very bubbly. She would definitely go all out. Um, there's even some pictures that um, we didn't see them today. There's even some pictures where like she, she um, does eye drops. She does eye drops to pretend that she's crying because she just broke up with her partner. So this student was, was great. So that's how we recruited her. Um, she was a, a staff member at the Academic Resource Center. Awesome. Um, a quick, another question is from Zoya Balava. How often do you show this throughout the semester? Once. So this, this presentation only happens once at the very beginning of the academic year. Um, but one thing that the, us beyond this presentation, the Academic Resource Center and the library, we also partner for something called tabling. So for those of you who may not know what tabling is, that's like when a, a student a student organization or student club or a campus department like the library, we will request for the campus to set up tables at various locations on campus. And we, we offer giveaway items like free highlighters, free pens, free pencils, free cell phone wallets. So in conjunction with that, with that presentation, um, we do the tabling thing to remind folks of everything they should have learned during the presentation. And one thing I left, I love is how when we do tabling, you know, about one month, about one month into the, into the semester, we'll do the tabling just to su sustain the messaging from the library. And it never fails. There's always like, hey, friendly and helpful librarian. I remember you. There's, there's always a lot of that. So that's a good question to bring up. Thank you. Um, Claire, do we have another question? Um, I think we have, yeah, we, we're, I think we're going to wrap now, but we will make your contact information available with the uh, conference session. So feel free to follow up with Ray on their friendly and helpful librarians. Thank I you. love that you were hearing that epithet afterwards. Let's give Ray a round of applause. Yay. And so um, just another norm for this conference, we're going to take a cup, just maybe five minutes in between. We've, 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 um, portioned it out so that there's a couple of minutes in between speakers. That way, if you need to get up and grab some water, go to the bathroom, whatever you need to do. Um, so our next speaker will begin in about three minutes at 
and Dr. Farmer, and in a couple of minutes, I'll go ahead and introduce you and then we can start just taking a little breathing room between each session. So just like in that last section, uh, session, our moderators will be pulling questions from the chat. So if a question occurs to you, feel free to type it in at any time. That way we can get to it during Q&A if possible. All right, our next, uh, our next speaker um, talks about getting students involved in the teaching and learning process, which I think is really exciting. Please welcome Dr. Leslie Farmer. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, really glad to uh, have you here, at least uh, virtually and raise um, a presentation fits right into what I'll be sharing today, and that is you know, the importance of student engagement. Um, I also wanted to um, let folks know just, uh, there we go, that uh, I'm speaking right outside of California State University, Long Beach, and that lays on, lies on the ground of uh, Puvanga, and that's an ancient uh, village and sacred site the Tonka Nation, and they are the indigenous people of this area. And in fact, we have a committee um, on our campus that uh, makes sure to uh, recognize, respect, and maintain that area. And we have one section of um, land that is uh, specifically not to be touched. So just wanted to give that grounding. Uh, but. Uh, for our, um, our few minutes together, we're going to be uh, uh, talking about peer teaching, uh, teaching adults, and some teaching strategies. Uh, but I do have to say that uh, most of this information really applies to uh, almost any kind of library setting from um, preteens um, on up. So, why have uh, that kind of uh, peer teaching or, or teaching by students? Uh, that certainly does engage them. There's a certain um, interdependence and also a sense of responsibility that's built up on that, as well as accountability. And the fact that you know they have an authentic audience, it's not just the teacher, uh, makes it um, higher stakes, but also um, uh, lends more credibility to it. And of course, in terms of the instructional side, it's a really good way for checking of understanding. We know that if we have to teach something, we have to really make sure that we know it well, as uh, in addition to that. 
Um, also, for those of you that are instructors, it kind of means that you're not the only person who's doing the teaching, so it kind of spreads the load. And it also then models the idea of a, of a community of practice. And these are all points of, um, you know, community of practice. So that we are sharing practice. It helps, you know, folks that are more expert to help folks that are beginning and also uh, recognizes that all folks have expertise. So it's not just, you know, so that quote newbies can lend in a uh, certain experience and insights that folks have been around longer uh, would also appreciate. So in fact, when you're talking about, you know, instruction, students really can be engaged throughout the process all the way from stating what their needs you know, are and where they are in terms of their expertise, uh, helping to determine what the content is and um, what possible resources would be you know, useful. They can also um, provide their own kinds of learning objects to um, add to the uh, repository of um, information as well as being able to demonstrate, to you know, instruct others, and to participate in assessment. But understand that for each role that students are taking that, uh, you do need to train that. So a very simple thing to do is to do what we call a fishbowl, where you know, someone can model it and other people then can uh, critique how that's going on, or the teacher themselves can say, so I want you to kind of think about what are some of the practices that I am using that you yourself will uh, need to do. Uh, you can also have them practice in small groups and get kind of a critical, you know, friend of uh, feedback. Again, particularly, you know, for adults, but I think that this is kind of getting down to um, almost all ages now, and that is the idea that folks are, you know, self-directed, um, you know, that they bring experience, that it's really important that, you know, that you draw upon their motivation, um, they want stuff that's practical, and also that we need to have both a cognitive presence as well as a social, you know, presence. So what I want to just share with you is um, different levels of teaching. So, so sort of like the, the easy to do quick starters and then building up. So pair share is basically uh, you might be presenting a particular concept and uh, or even just asking them, you know, a beginning question. Like, so what was your first experience in the library and just being able to have, um, you know, discussions with you know, between two people. And that way everybody gets to have a voice, it's low stakes, but it helps them to kind of ground themselves. Um, you're seeing in this uh, slide, picture of folks that are sharing a screen, and that's a good way to kind of, again, kind of share, you know, their responses and inform each other, especially. We were uh, asking earlier, for instance, in this session, um, like, where do I add things in Padlet? And another person was able to, to state it. So it's a very nice, um, easy way to uh, kind of teach each other. Um, when students are creating papers, uh, or even something like, uh, try and find an article on X subject to have then the peer review is just like, wow, those are really good keywords, or you might try adding a different, you know, database. So that's kind of a, a nice way to do that. If it uh, has to do with papers, if you have a rubric, then they can use that rubric to share. Wonderful for uh, at the draft stage of doing assignments or projects. Um, having a study buddy um, is another way that you can do that, um, sharing notes, etc as well as having, you know, paired projects. Um, when we talk about small groups, probably the default or discussion, you know, boards. So again, you might have a, an interesting open-ended question, a controversial one, um, and then, you know, those groups 
in the small groups can um, you know, discuss pros and cons, different points of view, works great for Zoom breakout rooms, because let's face it, we need to do a lot of this stuff online these days. Uh, jigsaw knowledge uh, basically means that you would take a, uh, you know, a corpus or maybe it'd be a, a chapter, break it down into small bits, and then each person just, you know, concentrates on that one piece and then everybody, you know, gathers and reports out. Another way that you can, you know, do that um, is having, you know, each, and we'll do this, for instance, like a, a web quest, which is a, an online um, kind of a closed universe, interesting question. And that is each person takes a particular role. So it could be, you know, a student, a teacher, politician, um, you know, a parent, and they research a, a particular part and then they'll come together. Or if there's different topics, then um, say that you've got four articles and each one's reading it from a different point of view, then all the people who are, have the, the heading of a parent, they would get together and they would um, then compare the different articles in terms of a parent's perspective. So that's kind of a jigsaw thing. Or you can do group quizzes, which is really nifty for checking for understanding. So uh, it's sort of like, uh, you know, teams on, um, you know, College Bowl, et cetera, where, you know, the, the group as a whole has to answer the question. So it's a, it's a little less stress for people and, and there's some kind of uh, uh, peer teaching along with that as well as, um, you know, just collaborative projects. So, you know, whatever the product is that several people are working on it together, each one takes a particular role or section, and then together they're able to do that. This is particularly useful for creating videos. Um, and then there's teaching for a whole class. So again, um, if students bring different kinds of expertise to a group setting, then um, they can say, this is, this is where I'm really good. This is uh, very useful in terms of technology. So maybe someone's really good at Flipgrid, another one at Zoom, another one at Kahoot, another one at Padlet, et cetera. So it's like, so if you have a question about this particular um, application, the go-to person is Sue, right? Um, that's where, again, the idea of having uh, tech content tips is good. So another way to do that is then each student who is an expert, they would then create kind of like a little study guide or FAQ for that particular technology. And the same thing can happen for a particular subject as well. Uh, it's great to have students leading class discussions that can be done as an individual or as a, as a group. And if it's a group, then they usually do some uh, some pre-planning in order to determine, you know, who is going to take which which role. But again, for something like a class discussion, probably just, uh, you know, a really good, interesting, controversial question and um, or moderating, like brainstorming, that kind of a thing. And again, they bring their own expertise, you know, to the table on that. They're able to ask good follow-up questions that they've already prepared as well as being able to fill in the gaps. So that's kind of a, a low stakes one. It's not as heavy as a formal presentation. Uh, students can also do screencasting and podcasting. So they would you know, set that up and then that would be available you know, to kind of the, the whole class. Uh, screencasting is particularly good for, especially for libraries, I'm just saying you know, how to use a uh, particular database. Most, you know, obvious you know, piece. And podcasting is really good, kind of what we call learning moment. So it could be like, so, um, you know, you're trying to find material and it isn't in the library. What am I going to do? I'll try interlibrary loan. So the idea that the student is creating the podcast and not just the librarian, the librarian probably wants to review it to make sure it's accurate, um, then uh, provide students a voice. Uh, and it's kind of that peer thing, so that sometimes uh, makes it more appealing. So that's a, and it also means it lowers, you know, the, the workload for the librarian as well. 
And I also mentioned already about presentations on content. Again, um, videos, Flipgrid um, are all good ways, you know, to do that. Uh, you can even do that, you know, again, in the public library in terms of, say, like a Flipgrid for um, um, book talks. So add that, you know, to your list, because let's face it, you know, um, as librarians, we are all, um, all of us educators in different ways. And we're finding, in fact, that, that informal education is so important because it you know, continues throughout our whole lives. Uh, so just a couple of tips, you know, if we're, if we're talking about um, helping students to lead discussions. Uh, so I have this page of just, you know, different ideas that have, are coming from uh, best practice. So again, being prepared, having a, a, an agenda, starting out with you know, a, a provocative statement, um, you know, making sure that you know that you do have checks for understanding. You know, calling on people who might uh, be kind of quiet. You know, uh, make sure that you're understood and communicate. So, having a way to um, to to do that, if in an online situation, that might be you know through chat or get that hands up. And then always be remembering to evaluate after. So this is for all folks in all kinds of uh, uh, situations where students aren't doing too good. It's like, so how did it go? How did it feel for you? How, what was the response? Did that make a difference? Did student, were students being able to be successful you know, to find an article or to be able to do correct um, you know, citation style, et cetera? So the more that we can help facilitate that part of um, of uh, teaching, that's really important. Um, and then also in terms of discussion starters, and this can, you know, again, can even start with the, the librarian and then get folks, you know, um, you know, started with good ideas that, that they make uh, turn around and then teach others. So, you know, short readings, um, doing some role play, using, you know, visual, um, you know, starters to kind of get folks, uh, uh, you know, interested. Starting with students' own experience, which is also a great way to do a diagnostic assessment. Um, you know, finding what the whole group thinks, having polls, little questionnaires, uh, case studies. Those are all ways to kind of instigate motivation and engagement. And these are all pieces that can be used by the students as well in terms of you know, teaching others, getting others engaged. Um, another thing that is really useful, I, I talked about screencasts, about podcasts. In effect, those are student-generated products. And I really wanted to push you know, on that because as you're teaching, you, know, you may create a study guide or again, a uh, you know, short video to summarize or to introduce a topic. So the teaching isn't just the delivery, but it's also the products that go along you know, with that. And I wanted to just um, you know, really emphasize the idea of open educational resources to that end. And um, basically we're talking about resources that can be um, accessed freely and openly for folks to reuse, revise, redistribute, and retain. And it adds to the professional feel. Uh, again, I talked about assessment. So how engaged are people? What do peers you know, think? Does that help them to achieve their learning goal? How does that impact your instruction? How does it impact any kinds of courses? And how does that impact the field? And I have a little cartoon. It says, like, I taught stripe how to whistle and says like i don't hear him whistling he says i taught you know, i said i taught him i didn't say he learned it so again it's not just the teaching is what's the impact you know on the learner so with that you know teachers are learning along with the students so i hope that you are open for sharing that control because it ends up that everybody uh, benefits thank you Thanks so much, Dr. Farmer. We have time for a couple um, Q&A if anyone would like to put questions in the chat. And let me go to my first slide. The 
that you can see my email. Thank you. Yeah, we're seeing feedback that there's a lot of good ideas to apply to take away from this. I think we're just kind of chewing on it. Oh, well, great. So Taylor is asking, what activity do the students um, respond to most? Um, I think that probably it, um, discussion boards work really well. That seems to be most effective if it's like a class, so not just the one shot thing. Although you, it can work if you are doing a one shot with a class that's already well established and where the teacher already has small groups that are put together, because folks really do like to, to share information. So like breakout rooms, it's just, it's a low key, low stakes um, way to do that. Um, they also um, appreciate, again, this, this works particularly well, you know, in a classroom set, or maybe you've got student workers and that is to do um, a screencast because they feel really proud of their work and if it's posted for others folks to see it's a real sense of accomplishment thank you uh, we have elizabeth nelson's question do you ever use students in planning a session's content or are you mostly bringing them in during the class itself okay i can you say that more loudly because i can't yeah. hear um, Elizabeth is asking, do you ever use students in planning a session's content or are you mostly just bringing them in during the class itself? Right, okay. Um, what I think is, what I, probably uh, two things. One is at the end of a course, I always debrief students and say, so what would you add to the course? What, you know, what would you uh, change? And also I would include, you know, their works upon, you know, permission and add that to the next, you know, class. Um, sometimes they do that in the middle of a, of, of a term uh, to say like, so, you know, what do we need to add here? I'll also do it in terms of uh, diagnostics at the beginning. Um, so that if I already know, they already know X, Y, and Z, but they don't know much about, you know, why, then we'll add that. Or if there's several students that need clarification or they want to learn more about something, then you know I'll I'll uh, add that. And I also always encourage students, you know, that if they find something really good, you know, share that. I have a special repository for that and let others know about that so they can delve into it. Thank you. And we can answer one last question from Ether, uh, which is about sharing students' work. So do they need to agree to make their work public yes. or do they yes. have an option now to agree? Yeah, no, um, there's two ways that you can do that. You can ask students, again, this is in a course, um, you know, that they kind of like sign off at the beginning. But what I really, um, is, if it's especially for another you know, class, because our classes are, you know, like self-contained, so it's nothing's, you know, public. Uh, but I always try and ask the students permission. They're usually, you know, I said like, you did a really great work. I'd love to use this example or another course. I'll wipe out your name if you so desire. And I've had 100% agreement, you know, for that. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Farmer. That's the time for questions that we have, but um, she has shared her contact info. So feel free to follow up by email. Um, we'll have a, a couple minutes stretch break before moving into our, um, our lightning talks, which are 10 minutes only. Thank um, you so I much. Yes, thank you. Also attendees, I forgot to mention that we have a conference hashtag for today. Um, if you're on Twitter, you can go ahead and tweet um, at hashtag LilyConf2020. And that way we can see uh, the ideas that we're generating. All right couple minutes. Our next presenter will begin in three minutes.
All right. Um, our next presenter wins the award for longest distance <laughs> technically traveled to come here um, to this virtual event from the American University in Cairo. I'm really excited to welcome Maurice Hines. Hello, Claire, uh, and hello, everybody. Um, thank you for um, holding this conference. Um, I'm currently in Cairo right now. Uh, it's kind of late, um, but um, I'm happy to be here. Um, I just want to um, uh, slide show. OK. Uh, so yes, um, I'm Maurice Hines. I'm a, a reference and, uh, and um, instruction librarian at the American University in Cairo. Um, and uh, I teach a, a, an information literacy class mostly to uh, freshmen and uh, sophomores. Um, and um, I, I came up with this idea of um, um, knowing um, a research diary as a form of assessment for um, uh, our class. So uh, I just wanted to share my ideas with you really quickly. Um, and so first I wanted to discuss what is a research diary. Uh, I guess simply put, uh, a research diary is a, a tool that researchers use um, in order to um, record and reflect on their, um, on their findings throughout the research. And, and I think it, it lends itself well to the digital environment. Um, um, I mean, you can uh, use a lot of different uh, formats, different media. You can use um, uh, Google Docs. You can use a YouTube channel, um, audio recordings, however you, you want to, to do it. Uh, and I just wanted to share, share a story. Um, you know, I just recently moved to a new apartment. And um, in the move, I rediscovered an, um, an old research diary that I had from maybe 15 years ago when I studied abroad in Morocco. And um, um, <clears throat> I know that I've lost, long since um, misplaced the, the actual paper. Uh, and I really don't have any interest in, in reading the actual paper that I wrote. Um, but in rereading re my research diary, um, I, I felt it was really interesting. Uh, there were a lot of details and extra things that I, um, that I put in there um, that I that I thought were were also interesting um, and probably a little bit more uh, uh, lively than the actual research paper. And then uh, I think most most importantly, I uh, had a chance to sort of see my process um, throughout. It lends itself well to an um, to an assessment tool. Um, so there are a few challenges that. Um, that uh, my, my, me and my colleagues face um, in teaching um, information literacy um, at the university in, uh, in, um, in Cairo. Uh, so first, um, um, we, want, we wanted to increase the relevance of our course. Our course is tied to an, um, a research writing course, um, but sometimes the students don't always understand the, the relevance of it. Um, they, they see it as, um, as uh, repetitive sometimes. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, also students, we, we often don't see uh, how students apply the content that we teach in this uh, information literacy course outside of our, our course. Uh, so I remember one time uh, a student came up to the reference desk to uh, print her final paper. And um, I just happened to notice that all her citations were wrong. And so I asked her if she took my course, the information literacy course, and she said, yeah, I took it with you. So <laughs> I thought that was a little bit disheartening um, to see that, that students aren't really applying uh, what they learned in our course. And then um, furthermore, um, just increasing this cohesiveness between the concepts, sometimes uh, the way that we teach, um, it's just a lot of different um, um, concepts that might not be um, uh, related to each other. And then finally, um, we have some problems having to do with uh, cheating, plagiarism, uh, breaches of academic integrity. And usually this happens when students um, 
don't, um, they just don't know what to do or how to do it. Uh, and we also have a, a few uh, secondary problems. Um, um, first, you know, our, our course is zero credit. Uh, most of the, the um, students are English as second language. Uh, there's some cultural differences and um, oftentimes they've never had any experience uh, doing any sort of academic analysis. Um, we can come back to that later. Uh, so, so I just wanted to um, just share, uh, there are two methods that I use over this, um, uh, the first one I used in the spring semester uh, when everything kind of happened. And this was an independent creative project. Um, and this was a, a, a summative effect assessment. Um, so students had to, they had the option of either doing this, this project, this creative project, or um, taking a mul uh, multiple choice uh, final exam. Of course, most of the students, they chose to do the, the multiple choice. However, um, there were a few students that did the, this research project, I mean, this uh, creative project, and uh, I just asked that they uh, include these five elements, uh, research project description. So they chose a research project from another class, and they um, um, wrote down the description, the research plan, research questions and answers, and then at least uh, 10 entries in a journal um, that they kept over the semester, and then uh, a, re a reference list. And I, I, I can... Um, talk about the pros and cons if uh, you all wanted to uh, talk about that later. Um, so this is a, an example of students work. Um, and I kept uh, some statistics on it and uh, had some student comments. The second method is what I use uh, over this past semester, this, this past summer semester. Um, and I um, did it a little bit differently. It was a guided uh, collective project. Um, so me, the instructor, I chose to do a, a blog um, and um, I would choose different scenarios and maybe some information literacy concepts um, and use them as prompts for students to reflect on um, maybe a little bit of uh, enrichment activities. Um, and um, and this was not a, 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 a final or a, a summative assessment, more, more of, a, of a, a formative assessment. Um, so uh, this is what the, the blog looked like. Um, and I kept some statistics, there's some student comments, uh, but I just wanted to get to um, my final concluding remarks uh, before we run out of time. So, um, <clears throat> So I think both projects are best done uh, in smaller groups um, because they, they do require that there's a periodic uh, follow-up with students. And also, I don't have this luxury. Um, I average around 200 students a semester. Um, and, uh, and I teach a lot of uh, different sections. Uh, so, uh, but I know that this might not be an issue for everybody. Um, so um, uh, maybe um, um, grading and, and follow-up isn't an issue for everybody. Um, also, um, well, the second method, the, the blog that I, that I did, um, kind of gave me more control. I still see the first method, the creative project, as an, um, uh, as an ideal because uh, it allows students to independently organize and reflect on their research. Um, they can choose whichever um, uh, medium they feel is um, comfortable for them to use, uh, easy for them to use. Uh, and, it, and it's also some um, uh, transferable skills that they'll uh, use later on in life uh, and in research. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to, to, to say maybe there, there could be a healthy compromise between these two methods. Um, maybe, um, you know, create a, a research diary template or workbook or uh, interactive uh, website or something like that that guides students in the process of reflecting on their their research um, and um, maybe some of you know of things that are out there already or um, you'll be interested in uh, creating that and um, maybe uh, we can talk about that uh, um, later on so this is my presentation uh, thank you um, and I'm uh, looking forward to any uh, questions, comments that you might have.
Thank you, Maurice. Um, Ding, I think we have time for one question, if you want to pull one from the chat. Sure. So Ash is asking if this was done only in the LIS class, how would you envision this in a one shot, or is it not easily transferable? So class versus one shot question. OK, so um, we haven't tried it as a one shot. Um, um, we, we teach classes, we actually teach uh, whole classes, and uh, we're um, trying to um, figure out better ways of assessing uh, the students. Um, I, I will have to think about how to uh, um, envision it as a one shot, uh, or maybe a series of one shots. Um, maybe, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us from, from Cairo and good evening over there. <laughs> All right, thank, you. thank you. Very creative methods. Yeah. All right, everyone will have a couple minutes um, and then our next presenter will start at 1115. Hey, Claire, I'm hoping you can hear me and see my slides. Is that right? Yes, Rachel, they look good. Thank Hold you. off for just a few minutes and I'll, uh, I'll introduce you and we'll get started then. Okay. Thanks. Just a reminder, our conference hashtag today is hashtag LilyConf2020. 
So if you're on Twitter, you can go ahead and share your ideas there. I'm gonna put it in the chat as well. Our next lightning talk presenter is Rachel Olson. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear and see me. Um, it's going to look like I'm looking up, but anyway, text that up. Um, so I am Rachel Olson from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, and I just dropped the link to my slides. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns, um, and I am the first year communication and social sciences librarian at UNCG. And there's my email. Again, link to these slides. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about using Goose Chase to make library visits more engaging. So first I wanna, I will explain what Goose Chase is, but first I wanna just explain kind of my thinking and development around this. So think about library tours when people come to our building. Um, how do we make those kind of the best we can for visitors? So a couple things that I always try to consider, what's the best possible format that I could use for this particular visit? So a lot of times people are just looking for a traditional walking tour with a guide and that's fine. We had um, a librarian who just retired. He'd been at the university for 40 plus years and he loved to do walking tours and he had, you know, all kinds of cool stories and strategies. Um, I'm more into sort of the a little bit more of a hands-on model. So scavenger hunts were something that I was always interested in. And these started out pretty low tech, um, just sort of having them, you know, find things and write down answers on a sheet of paper. I'm also very briefly at the end of this going to talk about breakout rooms. Um, <clears throat> and I know that there's a presentation later on breakout EDU, so I'll be interested to hear about that. I've had different levels of success and engagement from participants with all of these types of um, tour formats. Um, and I really would encourage you to customize each one based on the age of your participants, their academic level, you know, thinking about a couple of those things, actually some questions you can ask yourself. So who's your audience? Um, we get all kinds of visitor groups from uh, middle college students to high school students to first year students to parents sometimes. Um, so thinking about your audience, what does their average level of experience with the library, if you have a general idea that can be helpful. Um, what's the purpose of the visit? So whoever contacted you about setting it up, you may want to get as much information as you can about what they're hoping to get out of it for their group. And then who are your partners in this visit? So at my library, we're really fortunate to have a very active and hands-on um, special collections and university archives department. And I work in the research department. So we partner with them a lot to really incorporate some of the cool materials they have. They actually um, help us host. We start the program in their room, in their sort of classroom space. Um, and they want, like to set out materials and things for people to look at. So having partners, people who are interested um, is really important. We also have a great student success librarian um, who has started within the last year at UNCG and she's been a great, um, a great help. So Goose Chase. Goose Chase is an app. Um, it is free. It's for digital scavenger hunts. And I don't know if anyone has ever used this before or heard of this, um, but I really love it. I've used it for a few years now. Basically what you do, you go in and set up this digital scavenger hunt and you have what are called missions. So there are three types of missions. You can have GPS, photo, or text missions. You can see right here, I mostly do photo missions um, because they're something that People can just kind of walk around quickly, take a picture of something, take a picture of something, prove that they were there, and then move on. But it is helpful. Um, for instance, I did a question about how many days are you allowed to keep books if you're an undergraduate student? And the GPS mission sort of aspect of it um, is helpful, I think particularly in the time of COVID, which we'll talk about a little bit. You can actually have people um, maybe go to different places within the community. It doesn't work as well within one building. Like if you're in with an um, Jackson Library is the name of our building. It doesn't work as well because it wants you to have kind of a bigger area that you're working with. Um, but it is possible to use it effectively. 
and you can set um, the point values for this. You can also set the start and stop. So while I use this mostly for synchronous in-person tours, um, so I'll set it to start like at 11 o'clock and then finish at 11.45 or something like that. You can also, like I've done here, set it to start on one day and end on a different day. And I think you can go pretty far out in terms of the timings. Um, so you could potentially make it, I know when I taught an FYE class um, at a different school, you can um, set it to go across several months or several weeks and give people time to complete missions. Um, so lots of possibilities for this. These are just some examples of kind of missions that students have completed while within the library. These are some of our middle college students. Um, and I think they really get into it. They're excited that they don't have to sort of just follow someone around, sort of a sit and get kind of model. Um, they're really interested to kind of do the exploring themselves. And I will say that it's important that you set kind of some ground rules um, before they go like we encourage them don't run you know use an appropriate inside voice um things like that we also have some students that have accidentally wandered into office areas in the library so we've started putting up um just like outside our tech services department we have signs that say you know this isn't part of the scavenger hunt you know turn around go the other way um things like that but they really do get into it this is what the control board looks like from your perspective um so i named you can do up to five teams at a time with the free version. Um, I named them after campus icons or important people on campus, like Gilliam is the name of our chancellor. You can send a message to teams. Um, for five minutes remaining. Thank you. Um, so you can send a message to teams. Uh, you could send it to everyone when there's a few minutes left, or if there's one particular team that you think has taken a wrong turn or something like that, you could send them a message. Adjusting scores, it's easy to see who's in the lead all those nice features. I've used this with Chance, which is a summer camp we have for Hispanic and Latinx students, middle college, FYE, in different settings. And then I've even used it at a different institution with parents. And that was really kind of a cool experience. They really get into it. So some pros and cons of Goose Chase. Good things about Goose Chase, it is free. It is free. The asterisk is just to say there's some workarounds that you need to do if you want to really use it effectively with the free version. Um, and I'm happy. I don't have time here. I'm more than happy for people to contact me and um, think about how to use some of those. The workarounds are completely legit above water. It's just sort of something you have to get used to. It's easy to duplicate your games and you have the nice control center like I showed you. It's also very easy to evaluate and assess things. It's all in one platform. Not as great things about Goose Chase. Again, the free version requires some workarounds. Not a bad thing, just something that takes, it's a learning curve. It's also a learning curve for folks who might not be as tech savvy, um, but that's something that, you know, I fortunately have a lot of training in teaching people how to use technology. Um, so, you know, it's not something you can't overcome. And then user behavior, you do have to make sure that, um, People aren't posting inappropriate pictures as their answers or something like that. But luckily, the platform has methods that you can use to message and remove answers that maybe don't belong. Major tip for success, number one tip for success, when you're using this with an in-person class, give them iPads with the app pre-downloaded and a free account already made and have it logged in, ready to go. We used to ask students to download it on their own phones and create their own accounts, which is free, again, but it takes time and there's always someone who doesn't have a connection or doesn't have enough data or doesn't want to do it. So just give each team an iPad um, and send them on their way. We just checked out iPads from the circulation desk. We actually um, <coughs> have some now that are dedicated for goose chases. So goose chase and COVID, I know the big question is how are we going to adapt this for online asynchronous learning? And it is completely possible. So use timings and deadlines for missions using the calendar. Digital uh, missions are 100% doable. It's something that you could have them do, like a virtual scavenger hunt using your library's website. Um, you could also, depending on what your community looks like, what your campus looks like, if you know that you're working with a group of students who is on campus, um, at some point in the semester, you could have them go around and still look at things and do things. Um, and the nice thing about it is that there are ways to do workarounds so that individuals can just kind of work. You don't have to do it in teams. Um, so it's absolutely possible.
And then the last thing, I know my time is almost up, I do want to mention digital escape rooms is a fantastic option for sort of asynchronous um, kind of introductions to the library. This is an example of one that my colleagues created. Um, it's just the first page of one they created for our orientation this year. And I think students really got into it. It wasn't required. And we had more than like 200, 300 responses, which is really great. So much credit to my colleagues for that approach questions. Here's my email. Again, I am happy for you to contact me. Um, someone's asking if I have a link to the digital escape room. Email me and I will give it to you. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that um, presentation focused on such a useful tool. I've been looking through the chat. It sounds like a lot of us can't wait to try this out. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for answering many questions already in your presentation. We do have two remaining questions. The one is from Veronica. Oh, um, Ding, I think we'll just follow up with those uh, afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, we will have uh, another quick stretch break, and in five minutes, I'll welcome our next presenters. I'm going to go get some water. <laughs>
All right, I'm getting ready to welcome our next presenters. They are Elizabeth Nelson and Brett Spencer. Hi, welcome. So thank you. Um, I'm going to start us off and then Brett will take over in a minute. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump in. Hello, everyone, and thank you for your time today. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Nelson from Penn State Lehigh Valley, and I'm here with my research partner, Brett Spencer from Penn State Berks, to give you a very quick introduction to how we created a board game to introduce the research process. We're kind of going to fly through this presentation, but we would be thrilled to provide more detail and discuss our project with anyone who's interested. So please feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to learn more. And I should check because I didn't do it already. Can everybody see my screen okay? Okay. Yes. Um, so please check the chat for the uh, URL to our presentation materials. There's a digital handout of options for online game creation and an open licensed version of our game that you can download and use. Um, that link is also here on our first slide and will be repeated at the end of the presentation too. So the board game that we created, Argument Architect, is designed to help students explore the research process at a fundamental level, from choosing and learning more about a topic to evaluating sources for what they could add to a discussion of that topic, to finally constructing a well-supported argument from those sources. Our primary version of the game is a physical board game designed to be flexible to a variety of physical classroom environments and scalable to different skill levels and research interests. But no matter how fun it is, a high touch physical game really doesn't do well with COVID restrictions. So we've spent time this summer working on a digital version that's gonna be ready for our fall 2020 classes. The game allows students to have a sandbox style experience that introduces practical research skills in a concrete way, but without consequences or fear of grades or assessment. Um, typically we play Argument Architect with introductory English classes where students are generally learning the ropes of the research paper through at least one minor and scaffolded research assignment. So here you can see our physical version of the board game. Students are broken into small groups and given a shared topic, a set of cards representing individual sources with a short quote from the source and its citation, as well as a set of blank source cards and a blank card for their thesis or claim. In round one, each group chooses at least three source cards that fit together to make an argument, and then write a thesis statement or claim that communicates that argument. Librarians and instructors visit each group to inspect the argument, and we call ourselves building inspectors when we do, and we look for issues with credibility and relevancy, and then successful groups receive a prize from our library prize box, and they move to round two. In round two, groups are asked to evaluate the argument that they just created, and then add in blank source cards to indicate areas where they need more evidence or support, and they label those cards in their own way um, to indicate what they would need to make their argument stronger and what kind of a source it would be. We made some early decisions about how this game would be structured to help make it successful for a wide variety of students and courses. It uses a simple and nearly universal skyscraper metaphor, which helps students grasp the idea of building an argument with sources as materials, even if they've never written a research paper before. We stuck with a game also that emphasizes collaboration and constructive goals rather than competition and destructive goals to emphasize both the importance of sharing ideas in research and working together and also that the winning condition is to build an argument well, not first or quickly. Because the game is really simple to play, it's also easy to adapt to a variety of environments, both pedagogically and physically and can be easily customized to fit a course's content. And this is something that's really important for Brett and myself as the standard kind of for librarians at our school, we don't usually teach full course length instruction. We're normally doing one shot sessions. So we sometimes have never been in that room before when we come in to teach. So it's gotta work no matter where we are. Um, and I'll hand it over to Brett. Brett, you're muted, sorry. Thanks there, Elizabeth. Hello, everybody. So I'll pick up on the next slide. Since introducing Argument Architect, we've observed some informal effects on student learning and understanding. We found that in our post-game debriefings, students can easily identify us the core skills within the game. Our student construction crews are generally engaged in the gameplay and can explain for us how it 
simulates the process of writing a research paper. We haven't yet done a formal assessment because we've only recently gotten the game to what we're thinking of as its final form. But in the future, we're hoping to do some pre and post testing of research skills or pre and post assessment of research related grades. Informally, though, we've been continually updating the game based on feedback and observation from our test classes. Overall, we found that our students see value in the game's inclusion in their class and are excited to try it out. And our instructors have given us repeat business each semester. Five minutes remaining. Ah, excellent, right at the slide break there. <laughs> so in the next slide, I'll address a question I think is coming up a lot today. You're probably thinking, okay, okay, Brett and Elizabeth, how will you play a board game in the fall in an online teaching environment? Well, we've got some answers. We've been working on a digital version of the board game that would still have that same high touch impact as our physical game, but in a safer, socially distanced environment. During this summer, we've searched the web for a platform to host our game, looking for a platform that has these three characteristics that you see there on the slide. Uh, a platform that would still be intuitive and flexible just like in a physical space, it would allow students to manipulate images and stack tiles into an argument tower. Secondly, we look for a platform that would be accessible by a variety of devices, not only computers, but also phones and tablets, which many students actually are using for their remote learning. And third, of course, we wanted a platform that would not have barriers like requiring students to create an account. So we spent a long time scouring the web and we looked at Google Drawing and Google Jamboard as possible board game platforms. But as of now, we're planning to move forward with Padlet as the best intuitive and free to students option. We include a bit.ly link to our Padlet draft board game there on the slide. Uh, we explored, as I mentioned, a number of other gaming platforms along the way. And as a bonus, did you know you get a bonus in this session? As a bonus, we compiled a list of all the game board platforms we looked at along with our notes on each. Uh, you can use those if you want to host your own digital game creations. That bonus list is there in the Google folder. That list also includes some links to uh, sample games that other librarians have created with those particular platforms there. So you'll find that in the Google folder and then on our next slide, as I've said before, this is a project we're very excited about and we'd love it if you'd like to learn more about it. We appreciate any feedback you have about it. You can visit our Google folder to download this presentation, our bonus handouts, and you can also get the director's cut there in the Google folder. By director's cut, I mean the, a full length article that we wrote recently in an, for an open access journal. That'll include all the details we left out uh, in our lightning talk today. Overall, we feel Argument Architect is an adaptable activity that can be implemented and modified for most information literacy classrooms. And we have templates of the game there in the Google folder. You're welcome to take those uh, revamp those in any way you want and uh, use those for any any environment that you'd like to. Finally, on our last slide, we encourage you to reach out to us if you have questions, want to use our materials, have any kind of feedback, or if you just want to talk about gaming. We love to learn from other librarians out there working on game design instruction. We'd love to see your, your creations. Our contact info is here on the presentation. And, uh, oh, so thank y'all for listening and see you at the construction site. That was awesome. Thank you so much for bringing uh, this game to Lily and sharing those templates with us. I think we actually do have time for maybe a question if um, the moderators would like to pull one up. Um, yeah, I think we have time for one. Thank you. So Susan is asking what are the limitation of using this game, using the game. Okay, yeah. So um, I know, I'm trying to think, we've mostly used it with, at, uh, at Penn State, what's called English 15, which is like freshman introductory English classes. So one of the limitations is that we haven't really tested it outside of that environment. 
And we've also been very lucky to have um, a really collaborative instructor who has given us, um, I think at this point we're using what, three sessions from, from Tara's class um, to do this game. And that, that's a little bit unprecedented for us. So, uh, so there's, it definitely has a time limit. Um, I've played the game with English five classes, which are like very introductory English classes, I think usually aimed at international students. Um, and those I've done in like 20 minutes. We've only played one very short round of the game and it doesn't do the same thing. You really need that like 30 to 45 minute chunk for them to be able to do multiple things. And if you can give them, we talked about two rounds, there's an optional third round um, where you can give students a wild card and let them do whatever they want. And for one of those, we had a group that created a double tower showing the pro and con sides of the same argument. So they do some really cool things if you can give them the time. But for librarians who typically work with one shots, time is always is always the problem. Um, and the previous limitation would have been the physical nature of the game, that if you have someone with, although I have played it before with students who had um, accessibility issues. I've played with um, students with um, hearing disabilities and vision disabilities or accessibility things with that. And we've been able to find workarounds because they work in groups where you know the things that some people are not going to have as easy of a time with other members of the group can pick those up and students have usually been really adaptable for that i don't know brett do you want to do you have any limitations you want to add in um, one limitation i'd like to mention um this game argument architect we as, as Elizabeth mentioned we use it in english composition classes um it i don't think it can substitute for a a instruction session on the databases. The board game kind of teaches its, its outcomes are kind of just teaching you argument mechanics, how to build an argument and how to select credible sources for those arguments there. Um, it's good to have an additional session on how to use the databases to actually find the sources uh, there too there. So we're actually developing a complement game to this one. It's a tongue twister. So I'll see if I can say it evidence excavator, evidence excavator. And this one has students dig and mine sources for information that they would later construct into the, the towers that you, you saw on the slides here, there. So continuing with that construction theme there, can you see uh -huh. there? So. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth and Brett. Um, we will have a couple minutes break and our next presenter will start in about three minutes. After that, um, some announcements from the Lilly board before uh, intermission. Hello, Claire. Can you see my slides and hear me? Okay, I just want to make sure that you all can hear me. Yes. Great. Excellent. Thanks. And just a reminder to everyone in the chat, we are going to share the entire conference and slides on the Lilly website afterwards. So 
will be not not available immediately, but it will definitely be available to uh, for your reference. All right, folks, our next lightning talk presenter is Wei Sen. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Wei Sen, and I'm a librarian at Middlesex Community College in Connecticut. So today I'm going to introduce five tools that I used a lot in library instruction. Miyang. Miyang is an online animation software. It has tons of ready-to-use templates, characters, and prompts. So basically, you don't need a lot of technical skills to create professional videos. So I used Vyond to create videos as prompts for discussion. So here's the example. Oops. Give me a second. I think I need to share the... Okay, can I unmute it? Okay, so I'm not going to play the entire thing because I just because of time limit. So I created this video based on my conversation with a professor before the before the instruction. So I included the assignment information, included the, the professor's name, and that was a great way to build up the personal relationship with the professor and the students. And I only spent like uh, half an hour creating this kind of simple videos. And many conversations can start from there, just more visual. I also used Beyond to create tutorials for virtual library orientation and a flipped classroom. So this is another example. Hello, I am Paige, your virtual library assistant. In this session, after you log in, you will see your name. Okay, I just play these two parts because first I want to say that I used the Vyond's text to speech function. The interesting thing is students really like this kind of computer generated voice because for them, this is a little different and this is fun. And another thing is when I created this part, actually I used Camtasia. So there's another tip that you can always combine several tools to make the best use of them. Mentimeter is very similar to Pour Everywhere and Slido. And I use the Mentimeter to do pour in the class. Students go to menti.com and use a code to participate. And I also use the Mentimeter to do brainstorming activity. For example, for this activity, when students, they enter their responses, a live word cloud will be generated. So it, will, it is very cool. Kahoo! I know many of you are very familiar with Kahoo. I just cannot skip it because students love it. And we played Kahoo a lot. So there are two modes, teach and assign. So for teach mode, when you are teaching in a classroom or if you are teaching a synchronous online session, you can just ask the students to join at kahoo.it and enter the game pin to play it. So this is a great way to, for icebreaker, introduce yourself, such as uh, two lie, two choices and one lie about your library, or as a pretest. And I often bring candies to cheer students up. So if you want students to take their own pace, you may want to use the assign mode so you can share the link on social media or on the learning management system. So this is an example I want to share because this is something I created and posted on the college's Facebook for the National Library Week. Uh, yes, that's me. But just a bit, give you a brief overview of how it looks like. Yeah, so 
So this is about who, if you never used it. I'm going to leave here. Padlet. I used the Padlet for more than five years, and I'm so glad to say that at this conference, we were asked to introduce ourselves on a Padlet. So Padlet is one of my favorites. It is a little different than other instant message tools because you can, students can upload videos, pictures, all this kinds of format. So it is more flexible and we can do more things with Padlet. I use the Padlet for entry or exit tickets. For example, I ask the students to list the most important two items you learned today. I also use the Padlet to collect ideas. So I want to show you live this one. So this is an activity I, about identifying primary sources and secondary sources. So students, they can add a post here. They can like each other's post and they can comment on each other's post. Then as a host, I'm, I'm able to move things around. So it is very visual when we try to organize things. But just a little tip, if there are a lot of students, a lot of participants, some people complain that it will be a little messy. You need a lot of time to organize it. So fortunately, my classes are around like less than 20 students. So it worked pretty well. I also use the Padlet to ask students to share their findings. So this actually is a test page. This is something I plan to do for this fall. I want students to do a virtual library scavenger hunt, ask them to find an online item using the library's website about college success. So students, they can upload books they found from the catalog, articles, or they can even record a screencast. So we will see if it will work. Five minutes remaining. Thanks. Article Storyline is a very powerful tool for creating interactive learning objectives. So you may already use it for creating interactive tutorials, but you may not notice that it is also a great tool for creating games. I'm also a game person. So this is the example. <laughs> So we say this is false, then submit. So it brings a lot of laughs in the class. And I also posted this kind of link to Blackboard. And when I posted, the students would reply, oh, I helped the monkey. And actually many game templates shared in Articulate community. So if you want to explore. This is another example, choose your own research adventure. So I created this game. I just want students to reflect their research process. So students, they can just hit start and then they can select their character and then continue and then follow all the steps to choose their own research adventure. So it was fun. And uh, I think that's everything from me. So before we move to QA, I want to share this Padlet. So this Padlet, I posted my slides here, so you will be able to explore the examples I posted there. And I also shared some other tools that I explored or I liked. So in case you are also interested in exploring, I also want to encourage you to add your favorite instructional tools to this Padlet. So we can have a place that we can share ideas and explore new tools. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do think we have time for a question from the chat. Mm -hmm. We have two questions. One's from Maria, um, asking if VR can be integrated into LibGuide. You mean the VR? Yes. yes. So I created a video using VYound, then create, downloaded MP43, then I uploaded it to YouTube and then caption it. Oh, um, the question is about if it can integrate into the guy. So the question will be yes, because you're the yes, yes. YouTube. If you upload it to YouTube, you will be able to embed it to the little guide. Thank you. 
And then the question is from Denise, which is, did you purchase a Padlet premium plan? If so, which one did you purchase? Actually, I used the free one. So I was pretty lucky. Like I mentioned, I used it for so many years. So when they moved to uh, the pricing model, they changed. Actually, they allowed me to, to keep, I think for my free account, I have 26 Padlets. So I was pretty lucky. Now I think under the new pricing mode, you can only do three. So you have to like delete something, then you can add more. Thank you. Welcome. Questions. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome. We so have, um, let me get ready to share my screen. We have a couple of announcements from, one second, I need to find the window. <laughs> um, a couple of announcements from the Lily Board before we go to our program intermission. All right, should be ready to share it now. And great. Eva, are you here with me? I'm right here with you. Excellent. <laughs> Always by my side. Um, Eva has been so helpful this year, as has the entire Lily board. <clears throat> um, and I would like to let her introduce our new board members for next year. We have elections once a year in Lilly. Um, this is an entirely, you know, zero budget volunteer run organization. And um, many, of the, many of the terms last for two years on the advisory board. It is a great way to get to meet other librarians in other types of institutions and also get some experience with the conference planning process. Uh, so with that, I will, oops, I feel like I'm having trouble. Here we go. With that, I'll give it to Eva. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. It's been really wonderful to be part of the Lilly board and also serve as your um, Lilly co-chair and work directly with Claire, who's been an amazing chair. Um, as you can, as you know, well, as you can imagine, um, you know, a lot of planning and love has gone into this conference, with, which was initially going to be in person, but this has been a really great opportunity to connect with people um, nationally and internationally. I think that's the, um, the first time that we've ever done this um, via this platform. So thank you for working with us and your patience as we, as we explore this new area. So with that, um, I would like to just um, welcome some of, of the new entering um, board members and um, governance for Lilly moving forward. Uh, so I will be serving as your um, incoming chair. Um, and I would like to welcome Liz Cheney as our incoming um, vice chair, chair elect. And also um, Carolyn Tanai Goodell, who will be our secretary. Um, and our board, who also provides some of the greatest uh, wisdom that we can have um, from all sectors of librarianship, which is really the spirit of Lily to bring together all the different areas um, of librarianship that we encompass. So I'd like to welcome Aisha Connor um, Gayton, who's going to be um, representing the community colleges. Um, who I believe and, is here today. Yes, who's here <laughs> and who's been participating actively throughout today. So thank you. Um, and I'd also like to welcome Yesenia Villar coming from um, the public library sector um, and a couple of new um, folks also, Sally Romero, El Shaima Sakar, um, and um, a continuing member, Marsha Henry, who will be representing um, university libraries. Um, and also um, thank Jennifer Silverman, who is now um, transitioning from secretary to an advisory board member representing special libraries. I also want to say um, thank you to um, our exiting um, representative uh, who is a student representative, Diego, and I would also like to welcome um, our new representative, Marianne um, Ekujewu, and so with that, um, thank you so much for participating in elections. And please, um, if we could just take a moment to show some reactions. I see some love happening in the chat, but I'll go ahead and just do a clap and just welcome yes. 
all of you to this welcome and thank you um and also thank you so much to this this is not the whole board that was on this year but um thank you so much as well to like for the guidance of um past president mary mcmillan and Esther Gracian, and thank you so much. Also, we want to welcome, especially acknowledge our web committee, because this uh, this year with this year has been a little different with Lily. It's again our first virtual conference, so these folks have done a lot of hard work and diligent um, planning and thinking about troubleshooting options to make today run smoothly. Thank you so much. Um, there was something I was going to say <laughs> before intermission, um, but it will come to me. Let's see. Ah, okay, we would, we're going to take a break now. Um, it's a good time to you know, maybe eat if you'd like. And also please view our virtual posters. When we come back from this intermission, the first thing we'll do is have an opportunity for Q&A sessions in smaller breakout rooms with each of the poster presenters. So please check out the posters. Um, please uh, also give us conference feedback. There's gonna be this form will also be linked at the end, but this is a chance to help us build um, our, an even better conference next year, as well as help us decide what we want to expand going forward with the Lilly Listserv. Um, these groups that We've thrown up the logos here. We are not officially affiliated or endorsing, but we want to highlight um, some of the, the groups that are doing important work right now. And so these are um, library world as well as people of color. Um, these are some good uh, organizations to check out among many others. Um, Eva, was there any, am I forgetting anything before break? I don't think so. Um, I think that's it. I, I think I could just also just speak on some of these. So these are, um, these are some um, organizations and collectives that you can actively donate to if you want. Um, so we just wanted to share and amplify that um, possibility if you're, if you're able to. And that's it. Enjoy Thanks your break. very much. Yeah. And um, these are not live links, but please check them out. We'll put them in the chat again. All right, welcome back. Um, Vice Chair and uh, Chair-Elect Eva will introduce our next activity. Let me go ahead and get the slide. 
Thanks, Claire. So this is going to be the part, well, firstly, welcome back. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice break. Um, we're going to get a little movement going um, and rotation in our next portion of today's LilyCon 2020. Um, so we're going to welcome in the poster discussions, which are going to be done in the form of breakout rooms. So what will happen is uh, you will be invited to go to a breakout room and presenters will be rotated through those rooms and you'll have about approximately six minutes to be there um, within each rotation. And at 1.15, we're all going to come back together to the main room and resume our session. Um, so you have ample time to ask Q&A in there um, in those rooms. Just remember um, the poster presenters will be there and hopefully you enjoy this portion of yes. today's conference. I just remembered that we should note this part will not actually be included in the recording. Sorry about that, but it's because of the breakout rooms function in Zoom. Um, but this is kind of the live face-to-face -face discussion part and then the recording will resume after. Once we go into rooms, um, you'll get an invitation to join and go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to chat and introduce yourself a little bit. The presenters will talk. We're uh, just making sure that all of our presenters will have access to the rooms and that we're ready to go. Sorry about that. So just want to take this moment to thank everybody who submitted proposals because and and thank you for your uh for your patience with our process this year because it was kind of crazy and different um we definitely appreciate everyone sharing their expertise and ideas to make this possible
Hi, everybody. So I guess we're all in breakout session. Is this room one? Um, we've got Sarah Cantor here um, as the poker presenter. So if you have any questions for her, um, feel free to speak up, chime in. I think I need to be put in a breakout room still. Logan, did you receive an invite? Um, I I got jumped into one and then my Zoom froze. Oh. So I'm back I, and I think the main room, but I could so, hear like I was in a breakout room. Mm -hmm. So, so you... what I'm seeing is that Chris, uh, try this again. So I may have to move you to a different breakout room because I can't move you into breakout room one again. And okay. what I'm showing is the same with Carissa. Um, so Chris, Logan, and Ding, I guess, are all in the main session right now along with so let me move you to breakout room two or three or I was in one and then I wanted to go to another one and I, I don't see the possibility to jump from room to room so my bad for not realizing yeah. that was impossible. Krista I think I just sent you to either two or three. Did you did you get that? invite the second time around. Yes, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hello. Did you get a second invite to another room? I just sent you, I can't remember, either to two or three. I didn't. You did not. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to try for room five. I just sent you another invite. And I'm not seeing anything. I did notice that before when I was in, it said presenter next to me, and now it doesn't. So I don't know if there are two of me.
get that back in. I need two six. Because I don't know what else to send you. Um, now we have nowhere to send it. And I cannot move Sarah back to the main session. I can't bring you back. So let's see. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Lori. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. 
I don't know who else is here. Right now we're doing the breakout sessions. Um, and we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. And I don't know if we're automatically assigned to a room when you came in, when I admitted you, or if you are here. I know I'm in the, this is Kelly, I'm in the main room, but I can always just come back at three. That's fine. Okay. Because I don't see you under, let me try, I can send you breakout room. In the room again. Maybe that worked. as well. So welcome back after our poster session. Thanks so much again to our presenters for your flexibility. And um, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Logan Rath. Hey, Logan, I think you're on mute. Ah, yes, we don't hear you yet. There we go. How's Welcome that? in. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So um, I'm here to talk about the SAMR model um, and how I use it to rethink library instruction. Uh, I work in New York, uh, Rochester, New York. We're actually closer to Niagara Falls than the city, uh, which is a common misconception of New York. Uh, much like California, it's a large state. Uh, and it's, I'm about six hours of a drive from New York City and about an hour and a half from Niagara Falls. Uh, so I also, in addition to being an instruction librarian, I'm getting my doctorate in basically literacy and information literacy. And one of the courses I teach at my institution in our graduate literacy program involves multi-literacies. And technology plays a large role in that. So I in doing the reading for that course and looking at the textbook, I came across this SAMR model. Uh, and it's also something that I've studied with some colleagues on campus. It's an acronym from uh, Ruben Puente Dura. Uh, and there are four levels of technology use in education, basically. Uh, he analyzed how we use technology and came up with this model. Uh, it is, it does look hierarchical here, but it's okay to not be at the higher levels. Um, because technology use is all about the intention behind it and our instructional objectives. And our instructional objectives may not be something that requires a complete reformulation of the idea. So we start with the lowest level, which is substitution. And substitution is using a technology to do the same thing in the same way. Uh, so I try to use non-library examples here. Uh, and so that would be like using a whiteboard instead of a chalkboard because the whiteboard is technology. That's another thing that we don't always think about um, that technology does not necessarily mean on a computer. Uh, but another analogous thing for substitution is reading PDFs on a screen instead of reading a print article. And then audiobooks instead of print books. So you've got this basic, just same way of doing things, same way you're still accessing that same format. Your PDF is probably not super hypertext for linking between different parts of the article and linking out to other places. Audiobooks you still consume in basically the same way you do a print book. It's pretty much a one for one swap. The next level we move to is augmentation. And this is when we use a technology to do the same thing in a better way, um, but we're still doing the same thing. So PowerPoints with images, we're still presenting information. It's still in a fairly linear format, uh, but I can add images into it. And then email instead of postal mail. Uh, it does the same thing in a better way because it's quicker, but it's still basically written correspondence we're not leaving like video chats for each other in at least my library. We don't do that. We just send a lot of email. Our next level is modification. 
And this is when you can use the technology to do something different because of that very same technology. So writing, moving to blogging, it looks a little different. You can add links, you can embed images right into it. Um, and then with the reading, the hypertext, moving to something that's hypertext like Wikipedia versus a print encyclopedia, where you've got just this better thing now because of the technology. And then we get to redefinition. And this is the hardest one to just quickly do because it's using technology in a way that is completely different than what was even possible before. So smartphones, think about like when the iPhone came out, how that really redefined what we call a phone. Uh, and it redefined what we do on our phones uh, and how we communicate, basically how we live our whole lives. And then for academic librarians, your digital tenure or promotion portfolio with full multimedia content. Uh, I know at my institution, when I went up for tenure, I had computer code in my portfolio. And that's not something that works the same way as just printing it out and sticking it in a binder. Um, it does make the binder nice and thick, but it doesn't actually let you uh, use the code and see what it does and why that hundred lines of code was revolutionary. So we start with those four levels. And now I'm going to take them into the information literacy classroom and talk about ways that I've done these four tasks. With substitution, pull everywhere to ask questions. You know, we're still asking questions. We're just, instead of raising hands, people are pushing a button on a phone or on their computer. Using EBSCO's folder to store articles uh, in the Create My EBSCO account. And then creating a basic screencast video, it's the same thing as standing there and talking. It's just a recorded version of that. Augmentation, and my font moved a little weird here, so I'll fix that for the final version. Um, using Padlet to brainstorm keywords, this is something I've done with a class. I had them, I used the grid view in Padlet. I uh, love Padlet, it's a great tool. And I set up the three main keywords that they needed to use at the top and then had an entire class of 30 students that are all in a computer lab add one or two synonyms for each of the columns. And because of the grid layout, it locked it under the columns, uh, which was really cool because then they, they couldn't just click anywhere or drag each other's around. It just, it worked really well. Uh, another augmentation would be an interactive tutorial with a quiz in it. So Camtasia will allow you to add a quiz in. It's different. It's a little better. Uh, there's a functional improvement there because we can check for understanding. And it works really well, especially if you have a long video. Uh, and in some software, you can even set it so that if they don't get the question right, they get routed back to something earlier and have to watch that segment. Modification. Uh, this is where we can redesign the task. Uh, and Google Docs is a great example of this. So your annotated bibliography in a class, you have groups co-creating documents. They're doing something different than they did before. Uh, the analog way of doing that would have been to email everything to one person and have them compile it and email it back out. You've now cut out several of that. Uh, several steps. We also have Digo for bookmarking or annotation. Very different to annotate the web. Uh, and then also creating a digital story of one search experience. This is something I've used in an online environment and it comes out of my literacy training. Uh, instead of just having students submit their reference list, I have them submit a one paragraph reflection that tells me how it went. What were the emotions they experienced? What was the story? And I just title it, Your Search Story. Um, so they send their five references in, if that's what I need them to submit, with a paragraph telling me how it went. I get a lot of feedback that's amazing in there. Um, and it's just not something that I could have done 
without the technology. Um, having them put a screen, a cat, a screenshot in is great. Some of them do it sort of the analog way where they like hold up the phone and take a picture of their screen. Some of them use actual the snipping tool or um, command shift four on their Mac. And then redefinition. This is the hard one. And I don't always get here. Um, and I had to think really hard when I submitted this presentation and I said, okay, now I, I, I'm saying that this is one of them, I have to give an example. And this would be, you know, creating a class wiki, really creating something that you couldn't do that was inconceivable before technology. Uh, and you could do that in a Google Doc, sure, you could do that in a website, um, but really like linking around between different things, uh, that's the, the completely new way of doing things. Uh, and then developing interactive group projects uh, where they have to bring in several different types of sources. So maybe more of like a portfolio where they're creating a website as their final project uh, that talks about that. One of the courses I work with is elementary science or social studies educators, and they have to create a content knowledge portfolio where they bring together all of these uh, minority opinions and voices that have maybe been suppressed by the general narrative of what they learned in social studies. Uh, and we talk about that, that what they learned 20 years ago, 15 years ago in the social studies classroom is, is a little different than what we know now. So let's look and really create these dynamic websites that help students really unpack their adult content knowledge. Uh, and it's amazing what the students put into these. So now that I've talked about these, uh, these different models and the different levels, this is going to be interactive. And we have about 10 minutes left of really five if we save room for questions. So what I've done here to sort of think about how we can do this quickly is I have created um, a Google form and then I've made the spreadsheet available. And so the links are here. They're not clickable, but hopefully uh, they'll be put in the chat for you. And I'm using a second monitor. So that's why I find myself all the way over here. And I don't quickly see the chat. There we go. Uh, and there the links yes, are. Yes, links you, are in Ryan. the chat. Yeah. Uh, so if we would just take a minute and actually let's take about three minutes and fill this out. So when you go over, and let me stop my screen share. And when you go here, uh, this is the form. I would just like you to choose a level and then choose the, type in the tool name and a quick description about what it does. And then this will be a resource that we all have going forward. And while everyone does that, I'm going to look at the chat. Hey, Logan, there's a chat from Terry. Um, they're asking if you could put the prompt back up on the screen whenever you have a second. Oh, yep. Yeah. Let's see, so we're over here and do you mean the reflection prompt or the, is this enough to have the, the form and what you're going to do? Sorry, I'm not too sure. Oh yeah, they okay. said that's enough. They said that's okay. enough, yeah. And we have someone that loves Digo. Uh, creating a public syllabi, that would be something that's brand new. Um, that would definitely fall under uh, probably modification or augmentation, depending on how you did it. 
Uh, and yes, these results will be shared. That document is going to be uh, linked in the presentation when it gets posted, and it's going to be the same uh, link that you're at right now. And they're just rolling in. A lot of the tools that we've seen earlier today. Uh, someone's using Twitch, which is great. That's an awesome tool. Uh, Loom I have not used yet. So that's great that there's another tool um, that I can add to my toolbox. And APA Academic Writer, I've heard great things about it. We don't have it yet, um, but I'm really interested in learning more about that one. Five minutes remaining. Okay. So at this time, I'd like to just open it up if there are any questions. We do have a question. Um, Somebody had asked, it's from Megan Bell, can you tell me more about digital storytelling of search experience and how is it possible now and was not possible before? Uh, yeah, so the digital part of the thing that's newly possible because of technology is, the, is to create like a photo story. Uh, that's really the step. Uh, one of the things I do with this is I have them take a selfie in the stacks when I work with the elementary educators uh, that they need to get to a children's library collection. We have one in our building. They can also go to the school where they have a placement. And I can have them show their emotion through a photo and really take advantage of what the visual mode allows that the written word doesn't. Uh, uh, or they can create like a quick Adobe Spark story if that's what speaks to them. Uh, it's really, here's what you have to do, and here's a list of ways you can do it. Um, another question that came up is, who is using H5P? I've looked, um, but haven't jumped in. I don't know if that's really a question for the presenter exactly. Yeah, I have not used it. Okay. Logan, how long will this um, survey be open f to accept responses? I have no plans on closing it anytime soon. Awesome. So if, so I, if we think of things later today, tomorrow, we might yeah, add. Definitely. Or if you want to share it with colleagues at your library and have them add to it, that would be great. Very cool, thank you. And just to illuminate Sam Harlow's post in the chat, um, they're using H5P and shared their email address for those interested. We have about three minutes left. Are there any remaining questions? just want to say thanks for this really interesting thought model of looking at technology. I think it's going to be applicable to a lot of things that we do. Yeah, and that's what I found is that using models, um, there's another model out there if you're really hardcore into instructional models with education called TPAC, um, the Technology Pedagogy Content Knowledge um, Framework. Uh, and there's so much written on that. Um, and it's actually a three-way Venn diagram that is just gives you a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Well, if anyone um, thinks of more questions or wants to add to that form, please do. Thanks, Logan. And then I just typed my, no, that did not go to everyone. I'm gonna type my email in the chat so that if questions do come up when people are looking at the transcript, uh, you can send me a note. Excellent. We will take five and then I'll welcome our next presenter.
Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for the reminder. Um, Jennifer has just put a link in the chat to our evaluation survey. So um, we'd love to hear your feedback on this event and help us make next year even better. She's not really invited, but she's been being good so far. So <laughs> I know we probably, a lot of us have new coworkers in like these last couple months. <laughs> this, is, this is my, my helper. Oh, yes. Her name is Shotzi. Oh, I like her. I have a pug too, but he's too fat to pick it up. <laughs> too fat to participate today. <laughs> that's, that's my mood as well. <laughs> All right, just a minute and we're gonna, oh yes, Esther has some big puppies too that maybe don't fit on camera. <laughs> we're gonna welcome our next presenter in one minute. Thanks to those of you who have shared pictures on the Padlet. It's really nice to see faces, get to know people. Sylvia, I loved your sword. That was so cool. <laughs> Thank you. That was, a, that was a prop for the photo. It's a friend of mine and I, we decided to have our Viking photos made, which was really nice because she passed away um, less than a year after that. And we have photos now that I can remember her with. So that was a great experience. Wow, oh, that's special. All right, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to welcome our next presenter, Samantha Harlow. And this presentation was also put together with Jenny Dale, um, and Sam will be presenting on behalf of both of them. Welcome. Okay, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Let me grab this link. in the chat. We'll get started. Okay. So I am talking on um, behalf of Jenny Dale um, on a project we worked on together on peer professional development at a distance where we created a virtual learning community for all library employees. So I dropped the link to this presentation in the chat. Um, so there it is. Um, and I will check on the chat periodically. Um, but I timed this presentation earlier and realized I was a little short. So I thought we'd start with an activity to kind of see what kind of professional development opportunities us as information literacy professionals have been participating in and what we've liked about them during the pandemic. So if everyone either on their phone or their computer could go to www.minty.com and put in this code 437153. I'll leave it up for a second as people decide to go into it, but I'm asking a question about what things you've seen during the pandemic, uh, professional development opportunities, and what you've liked about them. So www.minty.com four three seven one five three. Here it is. So yeah, people are saying this conference. <laughs> yes.
Someone said low X. Yes, that was a good one. University trainings fail. It really highlights. It. <laughs> Sorry. Why? Uh, the distance for staff and institutional change. Yes. So someone's talking about this idea of looking at the institution, thinking through EDI. People are talking about EDI stuff, workplace equity symposium. I went to that one too. Someone mentioned a book club. So to so read and chat virtually. So people are talking about interactions, Zoom interactive sessions. Someone said focus web conferences with break off, breakout rooms. I know that this conference did that. It was great. So online learning and development sessions offered by librarians at my own institution. Great, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Purple, learning about stuff for your job, APA. The ACRL virtual poster sessions, ALA virtual conferences, the NASA conference. Great. So there's a lot of things. So a lot of people are talking about how they've been to these virtual conferences during the pandemic, and they're talking about this idea of connection, right? Kind of thinking through how to, you're learning about your job. People are talking about breakout rooms. People are talking about um, community, right? Learning about something like EDI, um, you know, uh, and how to better your workplace. So this is great. So cool. I just wanted to see where we were all at. Okay, so who are we who got involved with creating a virtual learning community at UNCG Libraries? UNCG is a mid-sized public university uh, in the middle of North Carolina, and Jenny Dale is really the um, brains behind this operation, and she couldn't be here today. Her pronouns are she, her, and Jenny came up with this project as a way to build community and to reduce anxiety for colleagues who are looking for remote work opportunities. She serves as the project manager. And I'm Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian. I'm also a liaison to some health science departments here at UNCG. So I was brought onto this project uh, based on my experience with virtual trainings um, and also logistics of these kind of virtual events. So we have, just to give you a context of where we are at in terms of uh, being an academic library staffed with many different people, we've been doing internal training and professional development for years. So, but to different audiences, right, where it just depended on your job and if you did instruction or if you did assessment and all these different things. So we have a structure in place to look at library instructional technology training um, in the summer. Uh, so where we do sessions on different instructional tech tools, we have uh, Canvas as our learning management management system. So we do stuff on that, on Google Apps, on, you know, again, what the last presenter was talking about in terms of instructional technology design, SAMR, all the different kinds of things, all about how you can enhance your uh, presence online. We've also done a session on summer of assessment where we talked about different assessment strategies on information literacy and a lot more. If you're interested in learning about these kind of internal peer professional development trainings, you can look at this presentation that Jenny and Maggie and I did at the NCLA, North Carolina Library Association Biennial Conference in 2019. So um, looking at this context as well, um, of course in the spring 2020, like many of us in this virtual room, uh, we went online around March 23rd, uh, all the courses moved online and then many library employees shifted to work, remote work in mid-March. The library was not open to the public, so really all of our librarians were moved to online work. Um, and part of that was also that we, we are and we're under stay-at-home orders. We're currently in North Carolina in phase two, safer at home, and we just opened up about three weeks ago with limited hours. We're open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, our time. And then Many UNCG librarians will be working from the home in fall 2020 as well. So we were looking for a way to kind of create a virtual learning community. So what is this project? This is quoted from the original proposal that was sent to our dean um, and that was written by Jenny Dale. But as the university's response to COVID-19 continues to evolve, it is prudent and necessary to consider options for university libraries employees to work entirely remotely. With that in mind, I would like to propose a new internal professional development initiative that I will refer to as the University Libraries Virtual Learning Community, and we call it ULVLC. 
So what this is, is that we draw on the significant experience of colleagues to plan a slate of online presentations and discussion forums in which university libraries employees can virtually present or lead sessions. Employees can present on projects within their departments, on research projects, on things they've learned at other professional development settings, on things they would have presented at conferences that got canceled, or just areas of interest that are library related. So what happened to get started is that this proposal was sent to our Dean in mid-March and then a couple days later there was a discussion at a virtual, a virtual all personnel meeting for our library. We, there was an interest form sent out through Google Forms on presenting and participating in sessions and then there was a virtual meeting between uh, Jenny and I to start a workflow detailed on the next slide. So we created a LibGuide, you know, I'm a librarian, we love LibGuides, and a Canvas organization in order to house the stuff. So we did both in case people wanted to do a, to, to offer people multiple platforms in which to present, whether it was a virtual session like the way we're doing now through Zoom um, or a, um, through a discussion through the learning management system. Uh, we wanted to give people multiple ways to communicate and to engage people this way. We then worked on scheduling hosts and then picking a virtual platform, which again, like I said, we decided to go with many things. Um, we offered people to do uh, panels, book clubs, LMS discussions, um, again, whatever they like in terms of how they thought they wanted to run it for our group of librarians. Um, and then we had them schedule it and we scheduled a practice session if necessary. Now that we're like months into this workflow, we don't typically always do practice sessions um, because people are pretty familiar with Zoom at this point. So we shared a Google folder that included basically all of our workflow, which um, included a Google Doc of email templates to send out to host and signups. Um, a sign up form that was used at Google form where people could sign up for sessions, a script for live sessions to keep the moderator on track, and then recording files and an assessment form. So then what did we do? We moderated the sessions. We always have a moderator, typically to how this conference or many of the conferences that you're talking about in the Minty were run, are run. So we introduce the host, we record the session, we help moderate the chat, and we help with tech issues. We sket at first we were scheduling about one a day to gain momentum. It was a lot. We were doing a ton of sessions. And now we're typically doing about two to three sessions per week, uh, depending on the interest level and the host. So we record all of the sessions uh, if applicable. Sometimes um, depending on the content of the session, we've done a lot of EDI. We're doing currently an anti-racist reading group. We don't always record those sessions in order to make people feel safe to talk openly about any issues they might face within the library. If applicable, we put it on YouTube, uh, the MP4 file, and that is where it's closed caption. We actually use a tool within our learning management system, Canvas Studio, to create the closed caption files of all of them. We then embed the YouTube video and any relevant materials into that LibGuide where we house all of our stuff. So we have a Google form that we send out uh, about each session and here are the questions we ask. Um, basically, do you like the format? Did it meet your expectations? How was the presentation style? And do they have any feedback for the presenters in order to improve? Did you have any technical difficulties and do you have any other suggestions or comments? So we send this out each time and we've had actually a really high attendance rate, a really high response uh, attendance rate in the sessions, but not as high in terms of always filling out the assessment form. You know, people get tired, don't always want to fill it out. But the people who have filled it out have been very satisfied. As you see, um, with the Likert scale, the five was uh, very much exceeded, was exceeded expectations. So here are some quotes about the series because it's been pretty overwhelmingly positive. Great series, love the topics. It was really critical for me during this time. Um, I can't always make it live, so I'm thankful for the recordings and so on. So here's the LibGuide. I'm gonna take us all out into it. But here's what it looks like. And y'all, it's an open LibGuide, so y'all are welcome to look at these. And if things are relevant, you can watch the recordings. This is an internal training, uh, so we would ask that you not sign up. If you sign up, we'll have to probably delete your uh, email address because we're only accepting UNCG email addresses right now. But um, here it is. And you can see we have a public facing Google calendar where you go, where you can see what we've done as well as what's coming up. 
So you can see at the very beginning of this, uh, you know, pandemic, like if we look back when it started in March, see, we were doing one a day, lots of sessions. We even had a bonus session in here. But you can see the variety of topics that were discussed. We have digital projects from our archives, algorithms of oppression, um, visual thinking and strategies. Let's talk about visual literacy, scholarly communication, basics, um, and so on. I'm doing a session tomorrow with our metadata coordinator on copyright. You can see we had stuff of a Python working group to learn more about that. We have an anti-racist book club um, that meets uh, periodically about every other week. We have um, reflective practice, again, just a wide variety of things. It's not just about um, instruction. It's not just about one topic. It's really anything. Here's one on lobsters, free kittens, and mons with David Gwynn and uh, Tiffany Henry. So this was about our content DM migration. I just love that title. So anyway, that's kind of the basics of the calendar. If you're interested, you go to the sign up form, which like I said, is a Google form. You can also read the original proposal and then uh, fill out a form to tell us you're interested in presenting. So you can see archive the sessions based on the dates in order to be able to embed them. So you can see here the recordings, if they're open and we feel good about it, we uh, put them on here and it's fine. So you can again, kind of see the variety of the stuff we're providing. So conclusion so far, this is an ongoing project, but our current conclusion is that the learning community is active and has been well received. So as of July 15th, when we made this presentation, we have held over 50 sessions, but again, there's been, I think about five since even that date. So for all the session schedules, we had a total of over 900 individual registrations. So we have about 100 employees in our library. And again, it's only open for library employees right now. We haven't opened it up to the larger UNCG community. Um, but that means that people are signing up. They're signing up for multiple sessions. And they actually come. Um, they don't just watch the recordings. But sometimes they do if they can't come to the live session. So future plans is that we've received positive feedback from participants and support from the libraries led to a recommendation to keep this project going till at least December 2020. Due to workload concerns when classes ramp back up in the fall 2020, we're considering forming an ad hoc ULVLC committee to distribute the workload a bit while keeping the series going. Um, right now, Jenny is doing the majority of the work, our information literacy coordinator, because this was her idea. This is really a passion of hers. And again, I just really help with the logistics. I step in and moderate a lot when she can't be there, uh, that kind of thing. But it's a lot to take on for one person. So I think this committee will be useful. And that's it. Um, here's Penny's email address and my email address. But this is an ongoing and current project. So we definitely welcome your feedback, questions, uh, concerns, anything that you would like to let us know. Thank you so much. We have some questions in the forum. I'm pretty sure this one got answered by you um, just now regarding um, were your sessions limited to library staff or were they available to other UNC staff? And I think you said it was library staff at this point. Yeah, and we have actually, sometimes we let in LIS students um, depending on the topic and depending on the interest. We have an LIS program here at UNCG. Um, but that's kind of like a kind of more of like moderators decide if it's the right audience, you know, if it's the right thing or not. Another question we got is, did the librarian do all of all, did librarians do all these sessions or did you partner with other faculty and staff at your university? Yeah, a great question. So um, when I'm talking about librarians at um, UNCG libraries, there's about a hundred of us and th these are done by a variety of them. Uh, so some of us do have faculty status here, but these are done by staff, faculty, et cetera, but it is only library employees. Um, yeah, we've never had someone from the outside. So there are other UNCG virtual professional development opportunities outside of this like virtual peer um, internal training. I provide, as the online learning librarian, I do uh, two webinar series, one about online learning and innovation, and one about research and applications, where we do partner with faculty and we also partner with instructional technology consultants uh, to talk about those two things 
Um, they're actually 30 minutes. We're pretty strict about the time. They're recorded and they're kind of done in a similar way. That's part of the reason why I was brought onto this project. I've been running series like that with faculty for about three or four years now. Um, and so, and there's other things that like our UTLC puts on, things like that. Um, so again, this is again a more internal thing and it's a more way for us to build community as well as um, learn from each other. Um, we have gotten requests from um, especially LIS faculty and lecturers to kind of join, but again, because of the content, because of like the safe space, we are keeping it internal for now. Another question that came up is, how is presenter participation? Do folks consistently want to share and present? Is this a part of your merit or tenure for incentive? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so far we've had no issues getting people to present. We do, like I say, have faculty um, status at UNCG. Some of us do. Um, and so, you know, the way our faculty, like, promotion and tenure process works is that you can count this as instruction and as professional development opportunities, uh, service, you can kind of put it in a lot of different places. Um, so, and I think again, because of all the canceled conferences, you know, y'all were great and like have this online, but some conferences were just like, nope, we're done. Um, we're really encouraging people to say like, oh, you were going to present there, or maybe you want to test it out with a smaller audience. Uh, we do it that way. So we've had no issues. Like I'm doing a copyright one tomorrow, again, with my colleague in technical services. And that came about because we were getting a lot of copyright questions with online learning. And we were like, let's just do a ULVLC session and kind of just get it all out there. And we can have it be conversation based and like make it clear we're not lawyers, but that, you know, we can kind of go through together what we know. And so things like that are popping up often because of uh, working from home, because of the shift to online learning and this desire to learn, this desire to share your research when you can't be traveling to places to present it. Um, so we haven't had any issues so far. Again, we've scaled back. We're only doing about two a week based on interest, but um, again, it hasn't really dried up yet. And uh, if it does, we probably just kind of shift and think about uh, you know, doing less, you know, one per week or, you know, every other week or whatever. And um, we have about 45 seconds left. And one question, I don't know if we'll be able to get through it, but how do you decide what presentations to host? So basically anyone who wants to do one internally in the library gets accepted. So if you come to us and say like, hey, I have this idea to do one on content DM, um, we're like, sounds great. How do you want to do it? You want to do a discussion? You want to do breakout rooms? And that's about it. Um, so again, it, usually it started out where we had a go that Google form that's on the LibGuide. You can fill that out. But because it's internal, typically people just email Jenny um, because, you know, she's really in charge of this whole thing. And they say, I have an idea. And then sometimes we will or she will have to kind of go back and forth and be like, let's think through this, like, you know, about a title and things like that. Um, but typically it comes together pretty quickly. Thank you so much. We're out of time now, so I'll hand it back to Claire. Great. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, I think it's so important that um, professional development opportunities keep happening, especially right now. So thanks for doing that work. Um, we will take another five minutes and coming back from that, we'll have two more final lightning talk presenters.
have a brief correction to the original program, although it's right on the website now. You may, if anybody printed or saved an earlier version, um, the Lightning Talk speaker, Bria Sinote, was not able to join us today. So um, the program will run a little bit less, uh, a little bit, it'll adjourn a little earlier than three. Thanks. All right, getting ready for more lightning talks. I'm happy to welcome Michelle Spagna and Lee Howick. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. I'm gonna share my screen in just a second. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, although right now, yes, we can. Okay, perfect. All right, well, hello everyone. My name is Michelle and today uh, me and my colleague Lee will be discussing how the reference and instruction department at the Red Rocks Community College Library uses digital tools, specifically uh, learning facilitation platforms to assist in our virtual library instruction sessions. And we're located in Lakewood, Colorado. That's the Denver metro area. Um, to start off with the background of our library, the RRCC library does have four librarians. That includes one instruction librarian and additionally two graduate assistants, which are students who are enrolled in MLIS program, which is what Lee and I are. The services we offer at RRCC are instruction sessions where we teach a basic uh, library orientation, information literacy, and research skills. We provide one-on-one 20-minute -on -one research consultations that we call Book a Librarian. Our reference model is a walk-up reference since we only have a circulation desk in our library. Uh, we offer virtual reference, which is through email, and we have a 24-7 chat service on our website. And lastly, we do embedded librarianship, which is mostly through some ESL classes that we have at the college. Annually, we have about an average of 44 instruction sessions, so that's including fall, spring, and summer semesters. After each instruction session, we do have students fill out an assessment this gives us a better understanding of what the students are learning about the library and some things that we can improve on. With that said, um, the week of March 26, 2020, RRCC and the rest of the Colorado Community College system moved to a fully remote classroom setting. This left us trying to figure out how to continue to support our faculty and students fully online. We've already had virtual options for our research consultations, but nothing for our instruction sessions. And we still had scheduled instruction sessions for the rest of the semester. So we had to move those fully online and deal with everything that kind of goes along with that. Um, the two viable options we had for our instruction sessions ended up being either a recorded session or a virtual session. The recorded ones would be just posted on D2L, which is our learning management software. And then the second option being a, uh, us like attending a virtual uh, class and then teaching via WebEx. So after figuring that out, our next obstacle was seeing how we would conduct our like after class assessments and our in class activities virtually while still keeping those students engaged. Um, we've used Google Forms before for like surveys, but we really wanted something to promote active engagement and the students could fill out in class. We were introduced to the software Socrative by a professor during one of our instruction sessions. And that professor ended up using Socrative in lieu of our own paper assessments that we do at the end. And then we learned about Menometer um, after seeing it used in a presentation. So these are the two platforms that Lee and I are going to be discussing today. But just keep in mind that there are free versions, but there's also subscription versions for both of these platforms. So there will be limitations when it comes to the free versions. Um, so we wanted to use either of these platforms in our sessions to bring our in-class activity and our assessment tools from a paper to a digital version. Um, so that, like I said before, ensuring that students are paying attention, retaining the information that's being taught to them, but also on our end, having the responses downloaded as a cohesive data set, since that's the reason why we do these assessments. Um, we get the results in real time, which a lot of survey platforms really don't have an option for. What's really great about these is the students can stay anonymous and it removes the obstacle of students needing to set up an account or anything like that. They just go to a web page. 
So before going right into the two platforms, we wanna talk about why active engagement is so important. Two examples come from publications, one in 2014 and one in 2019. Uh, Sarah Rose Cavanaugh published an article titled, How to Make Your Teaching More Engaging uh, in the Chronicle of Higher Ed in 2019. And she states, to engage your students most effectively, you should, whenever possible, try to involve them in their own learning. And published in 2014, when looking at STEM students, researchers found that students in traditional lectures are one and a half times more likely to fail than the students engaged in active learning. Also, active learning engaged in students did outperform their lecture-based peers on the same exams. Mm. So we're gonna start with Socrative. Um, to jump into it, I wanna kind of uh, showcase how the, te well, the teachers and the students portions of the platform are gonna be different. So what we're seeing right now is like the student login, but on the educator or the teacher side, you create an account and that's where you create and maintain your assessment, polls, you can do on the fly questions and more. The students simply just have to have an internet connection to a mobile device or a computer. Um, they can go to the website that's seen on the bottom of this slide. So right down here. Um, and so they would go there, they would type in the room name, which is created by the educator. So ours, our main one is RRCC library. They click that and they join. Five minutes and, remaining. Thank you. And whichever assessment question and game is already launched by the instructor is what they're gonna see. This is um, actually an example for one of the questions that we ask in our assessment. So this is right after a basic instruction session. Um, we do have two versions. We have a long assessment, a short assessment. The short one's only seven questions. They kind of go through it. And then the next polling, um, this is actually an example for the in-class activity. In this activity that we do in, um, in our instruction session, uh, we have students search a topic in Google, then we also have them search the same topic in a designated library databases or two databases, and we have them compare the two results. This is where the active learning and engagement comes in um, because they're doing it live right in front of you and you can see what they're doing. You can see they're submitting as they are. Um, and then on the educator side, like I said, you see the quiz results gathered live. So the free version of Socrative allows for 10 questions per quiz. So for this quiz, you can see right here, it says like two out of 10. That's the most you can do for the free version. Questions are structured in several ways. So you can do multiple choice, true or false, short answer. And then with virtual instruction now being the norm with COVID and everything, um, it's a really great way to gather valid assessment data to gauge your own access. A success, measure understanding with the students, and then gain anonymous feedback from the students. All right. So I'm gonna pass so, off to Lee. Hi, everybody. My name is Lee Howick, and um, I'm going to talk about using Mentimeter for an, a tool to engage students in digital instruction sessions. So um, Mentimeter is a great tool to check for understanding as well, to take a quick read on a class to see if people are following um, and also just to get students to quickly engage, put in some input into their learning. So much like Socrative, teachers and students use a different aspect of the platform. Polls and slides can be created by teachers under a personal account. And then once these polls and slides are activated to activated to collect response data. Students can enter a code, like a unique code that the program gives you, and enter it into a web browser. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to the last presenter, Sam. Um, she basically gave a perfect demonstration of what I'm talking about here. So that was convenient. So yeah, basically like we all just did with that last poll, students enter a code into the web browser login and they're able to access the question that the instructor wants them to answer. So um, right here we're looking at an example of a potential student view answer page and um, the great part about Mentimeter is there's a variety of question type options. So you could give students a multiple choice poll, an open-ended answer, you could have them do ranking and scaled answers. Um, and an awesome part about Mentimeter is there's no limit on how many individual students can answer your one question. Um, so you can cap student answers. So you could have students give like three answers or two answers if you wanted to on an open-ended question. But um, yeah, another great part too is you can also use a profanity filter. So um, to ensure that you're not collecting like undesirable answers that you really wouldn't want to broadcast to a whole class. So um, that's a great part about it as well. Um, 
Yeah, so Mentimeter collects student responses and then visualizes them for you. So this is great um, because this could be a useful tool in a full class discussion. You could ask, you could pose a question to the class, have students answer the question, and then use the visual, visualization to host a discussion about why students think the way that they do or what they think. Um, you could also use this as kind of a class pacing tool to build a consensus on, are we going too fast? Do we need to slow down, et cetera? Really just to get students engaged in um, how the class is going. Or you could just use it as a basic assessment tool to see if students are understanding. So what we're looking at right now is probably one of the cooler options. I really love word cloud. So um, yeah, you can create a word cloud with student responses based on a question that you pose. Um, so another example of uh, uh, something cool that you could do is create a multiple choice poll. So again, you could um, you know, pose a question, check in with how students are doing, any of that. And uh, circled in this slide, you'll see the code. And basically, again, that's that unique identifier um, with, uh, with the presentation and that's how the students can find it. So why do we like using Mentimeter? Um, it's like I said, it's got a variety of quick polling options which is cool, multiple choice word clouds, open-ended response, scales, ranking, two by two grades, and Q&A. And um, also the program offers the option to make purely content-based slides, kind of like, you know, a PowerPoint or something else. Um, like I said, it's got limitless student, student votes. So regardless of your class size or participating audience, you can have everyone answer your poll and you can see those live res poll results um, in class. Hey, sorry to interrupt you, but your your time has run out. So if you have any, you want to wrap up the final thoughts that you have. Sure, okay. absolutely. Okay, so yeah, just um, Socrative and Mentimeter are awesome tools to use um, you know, to check for understanding and to do assessment. And um, yeah, we ran out of time, but we would love to answer any specific questions that anyone has about these programs. So. Um, we'll put our emails in the chat and um, yeah, thanks a lot. And I'll piggyback off that real quick. Everything that's on this uh, last page in the PowerPoint is essentially, it breaks up the best things about Manimeter and the best things about Socrative. So you, we don't even have to say it, it's right there. But yeah, Lee and I will put our uh, emails in the chat if you guys have any direct questions for us. But uh, yeah, thank you for letting us share. Thanks so much, Michelle and Lee. This is really useful to see a comparison of these tools. Um, We'll have a couple minutes break and then welcome our last presenter.
All right, folks, could we please get an aloha in the chat? Uh, because our last presenter of the day is coming to us all the way from Hawaii. I'm happy to welcome Zoya Falevai. Thank you, Claire. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, no pressure there. I'm the last presenter. <laughs> well, um, Thank you I did that because of the, the time difference. The time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for me. <laughs> oh, it's only 11 o'clock, so it's perfect for me. <laughs> well, um, welcome. My name is Zoya Palivai, and I'm a library um, instruction and reference librarian at Brigham Young University, Hawaii. And um, thank you for holding this conference. I've learned a lot of great things. So my presentation today is um, using Google tools to enhance library instruction. And um, we've seen, I've seen some of you mention that you do use Google tools um, or, you know, Google spreadsheet form docs uh, in your instruction. So it's nothing new. I just wanted to share what we're doing in our library that we've um, found effective and works for us. So if you could, um, I know Claire posted the in the in the chat, she put the survey there. Could you fill that survey in for me? And I will share the results with you after um, the conference. So it's just, do you use Google tools and how do you use them um, in your instruction? So let's see. So we recently changed our approach to in, um, to our library instruction. Before we had like a worksheet and we had students watch um, a online tutorial and it was not effective at, at all. Most of the time it was busy work, rushed work. So we changed it so it can be more effective and meaningful um, to the, our students and to us as well. So we created these instruction, we have an instruction menu where they, the instructors will select skills and knowledge that they would like us to teach because um, we're not going to it this is um, only for our you know one shot um, workshops so we have basic re a basic research tutorial that we require the students to do before they come to the library at least one week in advance and also we have an advanced research tutorial and these are uh, the basic research tutorial these are just introductory you know um, information on how to use the library, what is a scholarly journal article, how do you evaluate a source, because when they come to us in the face-to-face -face instructional time, we want them, we want to focus on what they really need to work on. Majority of the instruction that we get, I'm pretty sure you guys um, get these too, um, is to help students find and locate sources, relevant sources for their research. So we want to spend the um, uh, we want to spend most of the time on the hands-on activity, and so that's where um, that's why we changed our um, instruction. So when they do the basic research tutorial, they come to us. We just get to the main point and get straight to what they need to um, to accomplish their research assignment. So we use Google Docs um, for this, for this um, workshop. So again, I, I know Logan mentioned it for the SAMR um, presentation and also Wei uh, Chan in her presentation. And some, um, I, and I've seen on the, the survey that Logan did that you, most of you use Google tools. And this is why I needed to, I needed uh, to find a tool that um, will be helpful and meaningful in um, teaching these workshops so I can monitor what the students are doing in real time so I can collaborate with them, assist and help them and why Google Drive is because it's free. Everybody knows it. Everybody has a Google account. Um, you can share, you can edit and it's there forever, I think. Um, so here are some examples. 
So here's in a Hawaiian studies assignment. So again, like I said, the majority of the workshops we get are, um, are helping students to find and locate sources for their research. So during the workshop, I will have the students share their Google Docs with me. So they have to share with me and make sure that I can edit. I demonstrate, you know, do other things, library catalog, databases, how to search, and all the fun stuff in information literacy. And then I give students enough time to locate their sources and copy and paste the citation of their sources in their Google Docs. So from their teacher's workstation, I do project the Google Drive up on the projector for everyone to see. And then I start making students, um, um, so if there's 20 students in the class, I make sure I have, I have 20 Google Docs. And so I open one document at a time, thanks. Um, I open one document at a time and go through their work. And this is all projected on, on the main projector. And I would stop if there's a issue or something that will benefit the whole class that I see on that Google Docs, I would stop the class and point out that issue and how to resolve it or how it will help with the assignment. Usually the students are busy with their own work. So the person or group that I'm working with will pay attention to me. So this helps with like, um, you know, the different levels of understanding. So, you know, students who have done this before can just do other work. Students that are, you know, this is something new to them, I can, you know, spend more time with them. Um, how do I, how do I collaborate with the students and how do I monitor? I look at their topics, I look at their subtopics, and I look at the sources that they provide. So here's another example of a group, um, of a group activity. And then if I see a source that does not belong there, I will make that comment, I will help them find a better source. Um, if there's, uh, for example, a student put in a book review thinking that was a scholarly journal article, um, that was a teaching moment, I made sure she knew what it was and then found a better article for her to use. Uh, and if I see, like I said, if I see a student struggling, I would spend more time um, on that student. So after the workshop, this is the reason why this is very important to me is because I can use this after the workshop because students will email me for help, you know, uh, more help after the workshop. And so I will, any, I will um, put the information in their Google Docs. If they need to make an appointment, anything that we find, so if we make an appointment after the workshop, anything that we will find, we will put it on the, the, the Google Docs. And if I find a useful source and I remember, because there's a lot of them, if I remember, I will go back to their Google Docs and put it in there. So it's a great tool for you know, us to collaborate with the students even after the library workshop because we only have 50 minutes with them or 45. So this will help me um, beyond the workshop. So as a librarian, I can monitor I can collaborate, I can support, I can follow up. Um, I also work with their instructor. If they need more help, I will share the, the Google Docs with the instructor and it can be an assessment tool to see if they're, if they're learning and if they understand. Um, the students, they're engaged, they're applying the concepts that we teach them, they're creating um, like their annotated bibliography, they're creating the assignment, they're selecting and they're evaluating because the sources I see in real time or after, um, I can see that it's relevant to their topic. So, um, and uh, the previous presentation, you know, they mentioned um, the active engagement part. And this is why um, I like using Google Docs because of that active engagement um, aspect. Okay, so lessons learned. Do not assume everybody knows how to use Google Docs. Uh, the prioritization of time and who do I uh, spend more time on and if finding a relevant source does that equal understanding um, how to find sources. Um, but this has been working for us and um, and I wanted to share that with um, you during this conference. Okay, that's all I have. Any questions? <laughs> there is one about um adapting this for an online learning environment that was yes. brought up in the chat. 
Thank you. Yes. So uh, during the spring semester when everything was online, I did a synchronous library instruction. I had the students do the same thing, share your Google Docs. And while I was teaching and we were working on doing a hands-on virtually, um, the students were, were, you know, putting their information in Google Docs and I was able to view that during this synchronous um, activity. Um, so yes, it works for the online. And um, because I taught the class this spring and we were, I was able to do the same thing as if it was face-to-face. Thank you. Mahalo, Zoya, for joining us. And thank you again to all of our presenters today. We really appreciate that you're sharing your time with us freely and your experience and just, you know, helping us improve our instruction. Um, I'm going to share, if I can pull it up really quick, uh, one, one ending slide for our evaluations. And I also really want to thank, let me see. I, sorry, I'm closed this window. All right. Here we go. So this bit.ly is for conference feedback as well as um, a question on there about the Lilly listserv and how you'd like to participate in Lilly going forward, especially for those of you outside California. We'd love to hear from you. I'd also really like to take another moment to thank the amazing Lily board this year. Um, this really is always a committee effort. When somebody nudged me to be chair, I was like, who, me? Um, but you really do not need expertise in conference planning. We do everything as a team. So think about it for the future. But thank you so much um, to our future chair, Eva Rios Alvarado, to Mary McMillan, Esther Gracian, Liz Cheney, Jennifer Silverman, also thank you for timekeeping today, Jennifer. Michael Habata, Marsha Henry, Caroline Coward, Annie Knight. I believe you weren't even on the board and I pulled you in because I just didn't, didn't want to do it without you. Um, and Diego Coahuila, he's our student rep and um, that's a fairly new position that we've had in Lilly. Um, as well as thank you so much again to our web committee team. Ding, Angela, Ryan, Jonathan, Tim, um, again, just really appreciate you being here and please make sure to fill out our survey. For those of you still here, I forgot to mention that the slides are already available. Um, thanks so much, Ding, for that. Please check out the Lily website. <laughs>